leave that one. Good afternoon and welcome. I am Abu Hakkinen and our subject today is nothing less than time. The division of time is on the surface level the easiest aspect of Western music to convey in notation. In the end, however, it is possibly the most difficult, as it's essential in all informed musical styles to treat it in an artistic manner, with constant smaller and larger deviations from the mathematical notation and from the basic speed. Uh, some of these kind of inflections are stylistic, uh, some of them are expressive, while others are entirely subjective. Every historical period has had its own idiomatic ways of handling time in music. Um, one of the chief challenges in approaching music of other times, uh, not our own, lies in the subtle differences of nuance that we have naturally grown to hear through the ears of our own time. Now, this colloquium, or uh, virtual round table, if you, if you will, uh, will present snapshots of new research in different fields of performance practice. We are here at the Ljubljana Research Center, uh, Research Center of the Slovenian Academy of Sciences and Arts, with my dear and estimated colleague Domen Maricic. Domen has, beside his performing career, had a long interest in research in, in matters of performance practice, especially the historical use, uh, flexibility and modification of time. Yes, it's so great to, uh, that you are here. And it's, it's also, I'm so happy to, um, to have everybody else on, on Zoom. Uh, so I'll uh, just present our guests uh, in reverse alphabetical order. Uh, Jet Wentz is a very well-known rock flute player and conductor. He has made many recordings with his ensemble Bulika at Remo. He has researched both absolute tempi and tempo flexibility and has worked on historical gesture and acting practices. Uh, I think that is now in Utrecht. Then uh, we have Inja Stanovic, uh, who joins us from England. Uh, she is a pianist and musicologist and has been working on early recording technologies um, and how have they have to influence performances and music making. Her research includes actually using these technologies and making what she terms historically informed recordings. Then Julia Doctor who is based in Atlanta, Georgia, is an organist and musicologist. She has just published a book on tactics and tempo in the German Baroque with Bordel and Brewer. Uh, the book has only been available since a few days and is so fresh that I have been unable to um, get a copy in time for this event. Um, and then Alexander Bolas teaches um, at Vassar College in New York and he's well known for his work on metronome technology and what he terms metronomic performance practice. Um, so how metronomes have shaped our understanding and perception of music through pedagogy and performance practice. He has published articles and book chapters on this topic and has been working on a book. Uh, with Apo we both find that this is an extremely important point for understanding at which point in history we are now. So I would like to invite Alexander to begin and tell us about modern age beliefs in the metronomic tempo. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. in how um, 
interpreters think about tempo. And it just seems that uh, it goes against everything I thought the historical performance uh, movement was all about. Uh, so my anecdote is this. Um, I was uh, performing with the Baroque Orchestra, and in rehearsal, the conductor uh, stops, and uh, this conductor is very frustrated, and takes it out from his or her pocket, I'm not going to uh, name names, uh, something very similar to this. Uh, this is a digital metronome. It's basically a quick track. And uh, this conductor puts the digital metronome up uh, to his or her ear and says, we are just not uh, in the right tempo. We are losing tempo. And this is to uh, herself, Fairy Queen, I think. And uh, it struck me rather odd that here we are, uh, an orchestra that's devoted uh, many, many years to performing with uh, the historically informed instruments, the uh, style as brought down to us by treatises, and yet the interpretation is being informed by a, a modern quick track machine. Uh, so that led me on a search, not for exactitude in tempo, but for what tempo means for any given age, and specifically for the modern age. Why metronomic tempo? Why the belief that tempo is defined by a clock technology, and this is a clock technology? Why that is so um, integral to so many modern day values of time, rhythm, accurate performance, as well as the reading of notation. So I would even argue the way we read notation in the modern age is informed by um, a modern day machine. And we take those biases with us, and I use us and we in the broadest of terms. Um, we take those biases with us even when reading historical notation and thinking about historical performance practices. So let's just make this uh, clear. The metronomic tempo, a, me a, a tempo defined by the metronome, was not within the culture, the history, or the aesthetics of Bach. He never had a metronome. Nor Handel, nor Persil, nor Monteverdi, nor Toscana, nor Machot. The metronomic tempo is unique to the modern age. A clicking tempo clock was not available, nor was it desirable, by composers or performers prior to the modern industrial age. And in fact, the notion of a ticking machine or an automatic machine was antithetical to the notions of musical rhythm performance practices and musical creativity up until the industrial age. That's what my evidence uh, shows, and that's what my work shows. And I'm going to now screen share just to show you a bit of that evidence uh, from a recent publication of mine. And we can get into greater detail about the meaning of metronomic tempo, metronomic rhythm. Um, this evidence, as I said, stems from this text. It's uh, chapter four in a sound studies volume called Cultural Histories of Noise, Sound Listening in Europe. And um, it's very hard to find these days on Amazon, but uh, there are volumes floating around somewhere, I'm sure. Um, after my anecdote about the Baroque conductor, and the Baroque Orchestra, I realized the deep-seated biases of rhythm, tempo, equating to metronomic action. These biases are seeded throughout modern performance and even the performance of our own day. Take, for example, one of the great pianists of our age, Emmanuel Axe, and his statement, most classical pianists, myself at the head of the list, don't necessarily have such good rhythm. We don't necessarily have a good feel for the inexorable poles. I had a hard time just being accurate, not rushing, not slowing down. Sometimes rhythm takes a back seat, so I practiced with a metronome, which I've been doing ever since. So, encapsulated in this one statement, 
are a host of presumption, good rhythm, and the automatic rates of speed are somehow aligned. That accuracy and an automatic inexorable pulse somehow align. And that rhythm is good when it is exact. And the way to achieve that exactitude is through a modern method. He's not talking about a historical method. This is a bias seldom stated by conductors, performers today. And yet, um, the performance practices can be heard if we just put our ears to the notion of the inexorable pulse. Uh, this is not uh, reduced to just a few professional pianists. This is a training uh, many children get from the beginning of a musical lesson. This is uh, the rhythm reading. And uh, underlying this lesson is essentially a call towards metronomic action, if not metronomic obedience. The beat. And here we have a mechanical series of parts with uh, a kind of pointed alignment to it. And underneath it says, in music, the beat is the steady pulse which underlies all music played, sung, or heard. The presumption, again, is that there is an absolute law to all pulsation in musical time for all time. That is what this lesson is teaching us. And underlying that, it's actually a call towards mechanical precision in uh, a kind of beat and a performance of the beat. Now, that lesson is unique to the modern age. It is a reduction of a host of complex processes about meter, um, gesture, uh, rhetorical delivery that in the modern age has been reduced to one fundamental, be metronomic. That is not um, in alignment with even uh, romantic era views. In fact, that lesson would have been considered of this quality uh, over 100 years prior, automatic. That is the quality belonging to an automaton. Uh, a thing that has the power to move itself mechanically. But more importantly, it also means uh, that which is not voluntary and not dependent on the will. So the modern fundamental lesson of tempo is that there is an activity uh, not aligned to your will, but towards uh, a mechanical law of pulsation. Now, one of the striking findings is that uh, even in the age the metronome was invented, very few people believed in the metronome as a tempo uh, absolute. Ignaz Moshe, who was uh, a contemporary and colleague of Beethoven, assumed that the musical world knows that marking time by a metronome is but a slight guide for performers and conductors. Um, later in the century, striking observation by accurate rhythm is not meant to measure those accuracy. And even into the 20th century, uh, the great virtuoso Joseph Hoffman said, never play with a metronome, for according to a metronome, a really musical rhythm is unrhythmic. And on the other hand, the keeping of absolutely strict time is thoroughly unmusical and deadly. So these statements go in direct opposition to the practices, the generalized practices of the modern age when it comes to learning good tempo and rhythm. So then the question becomes, if it's not the tradition of Joseph Hoffman, if it's not the tradition of Ignaz Moscheles, then what tradition are we following when we follow an exact metronomic rate? As my article points out, my book chapter points out, it's the tradition of experimental psychology and the testing of subjects in relationship to objective metronomic time. And we don't have much time left, but what I will say is that uh, the origins of the metronomic performance practice and the belief in conforming to a metronomic tempo as a baseline for good musicianship is derived 
from science and experimental psychology specifically. This is a text from 1895, which in a way seeds the belief that accurate rhythm to the metronome equates to good behavior, healthy behavior to the metronome. And you can see the similarities between an 1895 experimental psychology instruction and the modern age belief in tempo that we must be on a point of time external to ourselves to be somehow uh, a good, fundamentally, rhythmically accurate musician. And so I think I should leave it there and bring these subjects back during the next session. And I can obviously answer more questions about the scientific basis of modern metronomic tempo and how it um, diverts from the aesthetics of musicians from centuries past. But I think this is a good place uh, to end it now. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Alexander. And uh, we realize we have a problem with the sound settings, so we will, uh, at this stage, we will take some liberties with time and uh, take our time and, and, and unfortunate, unfortunately yours as well to uh, take a minute to, to imp improve it. Thank you for your patience. Get out, get out. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so apparently the, the sound is not very good and we have to um, find a way to um, turn off the microphone from, from the room here. It will just take a moment.
so I think we'll, we'll have to go on and, and, and just uh, try. The sound is apparently not, not working very well. Just a minute, just a second, please. Just a second. All right, then. So, we will continue with uh, Julia Doctor, who is in Atlanta, USA. She will present her book that has just been published. The book is called Tempo and Taxus in the German Baroque. Uh, Julia, please. So, good morning everyone. It's good morning from where I am. I'm, I uh, know that it's in the afternoon where you are. Um, so, play from the start. Here we go. So, I would like to present to you an overview of my new book. It's actually so new that I only have these copies in my hand um, for about a week myself. So the main question that I asked here was how do we understand tempo transitions in the German Baroque? And I mainly look at three different parameters. There are others, but uh, the three parameters that I look at are time signatures, note values, and tempo words. And I'm, in this presentation, I'm going to briefly give you a, an overview of time signatures, a little bit about note values, and tempo words I'm going to save for a, a later presentation. So the book is in uh, three parts. They, uh, the first seven chapters are a general discussion of the treatises, uh, which I source uh, from German speaking areas, mainly from circa 1600 to 1790. And then I move into score analysis and I, I, I use the organ music from Beckmann, Books, Tudor, Bruns and Bach among others. And the reason for organ music is explained in the introduction to my study. And then finally, I move into a synthesis where I uh, bring together all of the topics that I've discussed so far. Uh, and one of the most important chapters for performance is the 13th chapter, uh, in which I take entire works and I go through each, all of the, all of the individual tempo indications, the time signatures, the note values, the tempo words, etc., and I show how that would, might have functioned or it might function in performance. Uh, in a hypothetical performance uh, today, um, or how they would have done it in the past as well, perhaps. So let's look briefly at duple meters. So how I approach this is I, I go back to the Renaissance, but mainly to Michael Praetorius, and I discuss I, I discuss his idea of the concerto in which you have um, two styles of music, the motet and the madrigal, that alternate with each other within the concerto. And this is what produces these tempo shifts that Praetorius is so excited about. And so in the Renaissance, obviously, the, the slash to the cut, uh, the slash to the um, time signature C meant diminution, so that the note values governed under diminution were to be read as twice as fast as when it's not under diminution. And, but Praetorius says that, no, I'm changing this a little bit. Um, we're gonna have it, a mean or an average between the two meters meters, I'm putting that in, in uh, quotes, um, so that there's a, a, approximately a 1.5 to 1 uh, ratio between the, two, uh, the, between the two styles of music. And this is what creates an audible tempo shift. So then I asked, um, what would happen if I applied this principle to the principles later in the, uh, in the Baroque period, when you have um, more time signatures that arise? So this is a, a, a diagram that I developed. Now, it looks complicated and, and you don't have to see the whole thing, uh, but what, um, what is most important is that at this top row here, two one is faster than four two is faster than, the small allobrevi is faster than, um, common meter or four four is faster than two four, and I'm not, I'm not gonna keep going to the, the final um, column there because that's a, a, another whole aspect of later uh, Baroque theory. Um, 
And what happens is, is that as the measures of these meters get smaller, the tactus, the underlying tactus rate gets slower, um, but the surface tempo gets faster. So the, the uh, compositions governed by 2.1 or 4.2 have the slowest note values, but the fastest underlying, uh, sorry, so the slowest note values, but the fastest underlying tactus rate. And um, when you go to the other side of the, of the chart, for example, 2.4, they have the fastest note values, but this is the uh, slowest underlying tactus rate. So um, this is really important. This, this difference between tactus, underlying tactus rate and the surface speed is very important. And I discuss this uh, a lot in the book. And this chart actually has real world applications because um, here is uh, Bach's Art of the Fugue the early version, the autograph version in P200. And if you'll note, the first three fugues are in the large allegretti, then he moves to the small allegretti, then the next four fugues are in the common meter, then there's a proportion which we won't talk about right now, and then he moves to 2-4, and that follows exactly this chart that has been discussed from, from Prince to Kierenberger. So what I suggest in, in, box, in this section on box Art of the Fugue is that uh, Bach was actually composing a deceleration of tactus rate throughout the piece, and I think this can be, um, we can see this uh, throughout throughout this um, collection of works, the early version. This this changes in the in the edition, obviously, because it's uh, significantly different. So, uh, and then we move to the proportions, and I, again, I move back to um, to Praetorius, and I discuss his ideas of tripla, sesquialtera, and sextupla. And then I, I thought to myself, so what if these ideas can also be applied to the, the plethora of time signatures that arose later in the Baroque period? And I come up with this chart, and it's also based, just like the Dugometer chart, um, it, this is also based as, um, uh, stringently on, on the treatises of the time. And what this chart shows you is that each duple meter on the top here, 21, 22, 24, 28, has its own set of triple and compound meters to which it is proportional. And so, uh, for example, if you look at column 2, 2, 2, or 4, 4, uh, I won't go into the reasons for that here. 2, 2 is uh, uh, proportional to 3, 2, is proportional to 6, 4, is proportional to 9, 4, is proportional to 12, 8. And then 2-4 also has its own set. 2-4 is proportional to 3, 4, 6, 8, 9, 8, 12, 8, etc. And each one of the columns is one and a half times faster than the other. So what actually happens is, um, this is, uh, sorry, this is eminently practical because if you're running along in a, a, a preludium, for example, by Buxtruder or by Bruins, and you see 3-2, and then, for example, I'm making it up, it's followed by 6-8, you know that the measures of 6-8 are approximately one and a half times faster than the measures in 3-2. And so you can follow this. And it's, it's actually quite astonishing how well this works. Um, and so, uh, of course, there are exceptions to this. And, there are, and I, I um, delineate quite a few of them. Uh, and one of the main ones is the demise of the proportional system. Um, and uh, so what happens is at the end of the Baroque period, approximately, you can see this in, I think, around 1740 in box music where common meter becomes fairly firmly entrenched in composers and treatises um, as a quadruple meter, not as a duple meter where, that it was uh, previously. And so a lot of the meters that were proportional to common time were, were now assigned to uh, the small allegretti, And this actually creates gaps in the proportional system so that each duple meter no longer has its complete set of proportional meters uh, to uh, and so um, in this, this chart here that I'm, I have up on the screen, the empty cells are the gaps. And in my mind, this is one, this is one uh, reason why the proportional system, or this is one sign of the proportional system finally and absolutely disintegrating at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the 18th century. So uh, then I go through, I, I take all of this information, all of the the, the intricacies of it, because I'm looking at it in this presentation from a very broad, uh, like a 10,000 meter perspective. Um, 
but all of these principles can be used to explain so many perplexing things in, in the music of that time. For example, this is a, a case study that I spent really quite a long time on. It's Bach's uh, Fugue in E flat, um, it, where it has the three, uh, three meters, common meter with al large allegory size measures, six, four, and 12, eight. And I, I, I discuss at length at how we can arrive at the uh, proportions that Bach intended. And I come up with this uh, uh, idea where a whole uh, a whole note equals a dotted uh, half note equals a dotted quarter note. And I also it also can help us explain why later 18th century copyists actually changed Bach's meters. For example, one of the most notable ones is uh, Bach had the, the middle fugue was in six four, and then uh, they changed it to six eight. Um, and there's also changes to the first fugue, the meter of the first fugue as well. Um, and then if we move to the beginning of, of my time period that I'm discussing in terms of the scores, um, it can also be used to explain Beckmann's uh, triple and compound meters. Uh, there are, uh, there are, just as at the end of the rope, there are, uh, there were um, exceptions to my nice little neat little chart that I showed you about compound and triple meters and the proportions involved there. In uh, Beckmann's music, there are also exceptions as well. And here is example, uh, here's one of my largest studies. This is Bruns's um, uh, large uh, preludium in E. Um, and I go through, I think there's about 16 different tempo shifts or tempo indications in this piece. And I go through each one of them in, uh, in order to show how it would function in a performance situation. So this is one of the big um, studies in chapter 13. And also um, one of the, uh, one of the most intriguing, for me anyways, is that the, this whole study can also illuminate uh, the reasons Bach made changes in the meters, um, from in, again, in his Art of the Fugue, from P200, the earlier autograph version, to the posthumous edition. Uh, for example, in this, in this example here, uh, the early versions had 3-4, and then it was changed later to 3-2, and um, the, the theories that I explain and I, I discuss in the book and help uh, illuminate these changes. So um, if you would like to learn more, I have, um, I invite you to go to the website of Boydell and Brewer, it's uh, up there. And I also like to take this time just to point you to um, my website because there is a, an appendix that goes along with um, the book under Baroque Temple here, and it's uh, I've, I've uh, included in this appendix uh, quite an extensive list of, um, of transcriptions and translations that are referenced along with the book. So uh, if you would like to read the book along with the, the, um, the appendix, I'm sure that would help the discussion a lot. So um, with that, I, I thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much, Julia. Uh, we, we apologize for the sound problems. Um, it seems that we just have to keep very quiet here in the room um, and that this is the only solution for the moment. Um, and I'll continue um, myself with my talk. Um, And um, I would like to talk about early tempo modification, about changing the measure or varying the beat, as they called it in the 16th and 17th centuries. Such practices are explained in countless sources, and one of the best no known early ones is Nicola Vicentino's description of 1555, which speaks about vocal ensembles um, changing the measure in madrigals and other secu secular vocal music. We read about various things that would induce one to change the tempo within a piece, the most common being the sense of the words and the harmony. By the latter, harmony is probably to be understood in its broader sense, embracing various aspects of the composition. Sometimes the wording itself implies an association with rhetoric, and Vicentino suggests orators as a model. First and foremost, such tactus changes helped to express the affect and move the emotions. Besides, they met the need for variety, 
which is another important factor often mentioned in connection with tempo changes. We must bear in mind that the tempo within a piece could sometimes change mainly in order to provide variety. For example, when material is repeated or when a performer feels that the same beat has already been going on for too long, tiring the ears of the listeners. One important message is that various note values and simple proportions alone were not considered sufficient for expressing affect and providing variety. The speed of the beat was perceived as an important parameter on its own, operating together with other components. So the idea of this particular type of tempo modification is to start the piece in a certain tempo, but then to change or vary it in the course of the performance. It is often explained that the beat could later return to the original speed, perhaps producing just a short section in a different tempo. In the 16th and 17th century, um, this was seen by many to be an important essential part of performance aesthetics. In Germany, for example, it often appears among rules for singing written for school children. It is essential to realize that such tempo changes do not in any way exclude simultaneous use of other types of flexibility, such as agogic freedom, rhythmic alteration, contrametric rubato, the practice of momentarily suspending the beat, or indeed any other form of managing tempo and rhythm expressively or creatively. It is a relatively widespread misapprehension to claim absolute primacy for one particular practice in a given historical period, brushing aside the evidence for other types of flexibility. Many sources make it clear that such tempo changes were traditionally not fixed or predetermined and were rather left to the performer's discretion. One aspect was practicability. Solo performers, including singers accompanied by an instrument, are described as being essentially more flexible as compared to those in an ensemble. It is often pointed out that solo performers could vary the beat at their pleasure. A certain degree of flexibility about when to employ tempo changes is already implied by Vicentino's remark that singers in an ensemble will have to agree where to change the tempo. The use of this technique also depended on competence. Beginners were first accept, expected to master good timekeeping before eventually employing tempo modification. These seem to be some of the reasons why tempo modification was largely left to performers. They could adapt to the occasion, to their colleagues, or also to their own proficiency and sensibility, similarly as they did when adding ornaments. In fact, tempo changes are sometimes described as adorning or adding grace to the music. Modern discussions of tempo in this period often fail to take this variability of approach into consideration. They also tend to neglect the elements described in the sources, such as the sense of the words, the harmony, affect and variety. But there is more. We seem to have inherited to a large extent from the 1950s a struggle with the very idea of changing the tempo during the course of the piece. I will try to illustrate this by some music examples. Although Vicentino claims that changes of measure cannot be written down, his contemporaries occasionally suggest at least some basic tempo changes by verbal instructions, by changes of time signature or other means. I will attempt a short overview of such methods and will also show how they are frequently misunderstood, ignored or rejected by modern scholars and editors. One of the clearest and least ambiguous means of indicating a change of tempo would seem to be a change of time signature. I have already shown a quote by Clarion uh, explaining the practice of indicating a change to faster tempo by drawing a line through the sign, changing uh, from C to cut C, for example. Here is a piece by the 16th century Spanish organist Francisco Fernández Palero, published in 1557. Not only do we see a new sign after the first 11 bars, just before the middle of the piece, but there is also an explanation. You are to play in compas mayor until where the time is changed and afterwards in compasillo. This may seem clear enough, but an academic article from 2011 maintains that this change only concerns the manner of beating and that the performer is supposed to change from beating semi-briefs to counting minims twice faster, keeping the tempo essentially unchanged. Another article in a well-known academic journal published in the same year, 
2011, similarly maintains that it is not entirely clear that Vicentino is referring to anything more than the method of beating. This would imply maintaining the same tactus and proportional relationships regardless of text, affect and harmony. My second example is the beginning of a mass by Adriano Banchieri. In the second Kyrie, Banchieri repeats the music heard at the beginning, but writes it in half note values. This dot does not mean doubling the speed. Banchieri rules this out by using a different time signature, suggesting a slower meaning beat for the fast notation. He described the difference uh, between C and cut C in various publications, explaining that in contrast to the original meaning of these signs, performers beat both of them similarly. The beat is always on the minimum, but it is slower in C and faster in cut C. This difference is likewise described by many of his contemporaries, and there is little reason to believe that the relationship would have been one against two. Such a proportion is demanded in the obvious case, of course, when these signs occur simultaneously in different voices, but the beat then happens on different levels on meanings and semi briefs Banchieri's method seems much clearer than changing the time signature alone. It is easy to find examples where similar changes of note values happen within a movement, perhaps for a comparable reason, reason but without any corresponding change of time signature. Michael Pretorius describes this as mixing motet and magical style, something that Julia talked about. In the preface to De Sicuri, his collection of French dance music, Pretorius writes that he found no better way of showing the differences in tempo between movements or sections in a ballet than to make use of various signatures. In duple time, he uses as many as four different signs. Here we see three of them indicating a different tempo in each dance. Something similar is found in the music of Jean-Baptiste Lully and his contemporaries. Here is an example of an entrée, where in the second half of the piece the tempo changes four times within 16 bars of two medium beats each. It becomes faster and then faster again, afterwards it slows down and finally returns to the original time signature. While it is difficult, while it is difficult to dispute the meaning of these signatures in this particular case, we often hear in modern discussions how it is all unclear and how not all theorists agree whether 2 is faster or slower than cut C. To make matter worse, um, Quantz's explanation of cut C being twice as fast as C is sometimes brought in. He is of course comparing alla breve in minims and common time in crotchets. Finally, Johann Sebastian Bach occasionally uses the same method for indicating different tempi for dances of the same type, but this goes largely unnoticed by today's scholars and performers. A good example are the six cello suites. All of them contain pair of pairs of dance dances and Bach changes the time signature meaningfully in every second suite. The tempo speeds up in the second minuet of the second suite, the one that you see on your screen, then the second bourrée from the fourth suite slows down, and the second gavotte in the sixth suite is again faster than the first one. This all makes sense musically. A relatively recent and otherwise very useful book on Bach's solo works fails to notice this change of signature in the second suite. The author writes that the change in the fourth suite, seen here, may imply a relaxation of tempo, though perhaps the contrast of note values achieves this sufficiently." Unquote. Then there is a whole paragraph discuss discussing the signatures in the sixth suite, but with no clear results suggesting that Bach perhaps wanted to represent both signatures since they were both in common use, or that the difference may be one of, of affect or style. Similar changes of signature are found elsewhere in Bach's works, but they are not always reproduced in modern editions and remain hidden to most performers. Two such cases are the minuet and trio from the first Brandenburg concerto and the two minuets from the E major violin partita. Both are found in Bach's autograph, but the changes of signature are ignored in 
the neue Bachausgabe. Later in my second short talk, I will present some more unusual and idiosyncratic early methods of indicating tempo changes. Thank you. Thank you, Domen. That is most I find most fascinating. That, um, and I and I bet many performers have ever paid attention to these examples of, of Bach's uh, suites, for example. I, I must point out, though, that the one in, in the E major. Uh, Party, that the minuet also exists in the keyboard version where both minuets indeed have a 3 4 in, in Bach's autograph. Another thought that, that came, came to me is that wouldn't this, this dozens of, of seventh, uh, 16th and 17th century composers found it just great to have a metronome instead of uh, finding uh, finding um, more or less cryptic ways of indicating the, the tempo changes they they want uh, even every four bars like you like you showed in some cases. Um, I, I would actually actually like to ask um, Alexander Bonus. How how do you see that, that this this um, um, relation be between this this kind of musicians? In, in the Renaissance, early Baroque times, who took great pains to indicate uh, rather constant tempo changes, and the 19th century world, where, where the metronome was actually looked upon with, with some, um, let's say, like, 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 you, like you referred to in, in your speech, it, it did not meet with the universal Acceptance, and it was it was many many important musicians even found it d distractive and 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 um, without any any without much practical use. How, how I I'm, I'm at pains to to, to have have this this all this all these ideas coexisting somehow. Could you perhaps uh, enlighten your thoughts on this? Well, I can address some of them. I don't know if I can enlighten. Please let me know if you can't hear me. Um, yes. There's a modern penchant for um, wanting a mechanical answer to the past. Um, that if uh, a historic composer just had a more precise mechanical way of explaining something, they would use it. Um, that's a presumption that I don't think can uh, be borne out in history. Um, I can address early metronome technologies and their speculative use, but um, they were not of the clockwork variety. They were uh, simple pendulums. So Mersenne speculated upon a simple pendulum, uh, but even he said, this is going to be impossible to use because musicians change the pulse uh, almost every bar to express something in a madrigal. And so we have to admit to the fact there is an innate variability to human performance and a desired variability to human performance, especially in the magical style, um, especially when there's text that relates something beyond just mechanical regularity. So I'm of the opinion that if uh, historical composers had a metronome, uh, they'd be very confused by it and they would um, find their ways of doing things uh, just fine for their own purposes. And there were other methods, obviously, and I can talk about that in my uh, second uh, presentation. There was a basis to musical time, but it was of a non-objective standard. It was often expressed as a subjective um, sensation. And that's something I think we have to come to terms with, is that feeling is a historically accurate uh, standard for musical time. And there are numerous uh, Renaissance and Baroque treatises that explain the nature of feeling as being intrinsic to metered music and even proportionality. So uh, that's uh, where I stand on, on that. I don't think the metronome would solve any problems. I think it would change the formula. Thank you. Um... 
if any any of the other other presenters likes to comment and at this stage yes we have um Inya, right Hi, thank you, thank you everybody for this uh, ama amazing set of talks. I have a question for Alexander, I'm afraid, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm just curious about something. Uh, actually, it's a couple of things. I do understand that all these changes in musical history never happened all at once. It's just happened bit by bit and it's very difficult to say when something became popular or not popular or something. But what is your opinion? Uh, when did a metronome start being included in like normal uh, music uh, teaching, yeah, like in the lessons. And the second thing is what I want to ask you. Do you think there is any connection between metronome and then various types of apparatus, like these things, what people used when they were taught music? You know, I, I, I think about this thing from Edinburgh University, from John Donaldson, where you put your hands in this horrible thing which leads you over the piano. I, I would not put my hand in that. <laughs> but, the, uh, yeah. So how the is that? Yeah. No, the dactylon. Yeah, the um, dactylon. <laughs> well, your instincts are right about this. Um, the intense incorporation of the metronome in pedagogy happens in the 20th century. Uh, and I addressed that a, a bit in my previous presentation, that the scientific application of the metronome as defining a law of time is a modernistic practice. Now, the metronome was promoted by Metzel in 1818, and he took many, many years to improve upon the technology. And it had been in uh, the musical scene throughout the 1800s, but uh, what we find is that it was always considered an addendum if you needed it and for very specific brief reasons and never to play with, never to act with, never to mimic. The mimicking of a metronomic beat is a 20th century phenomenon. Yeah, and it is wrapped up in the science of physiology and psychology as being a, a mechanical standard to follow and to um, pattern one's behavior upon. Okay, M M many thanks. I have a question for, for Julia, actually. Um, and because I, you know, I, I insist on, on so much on affect and, um, and, and the, the words and so on. So where, where does this um, come in? in <laughs> In organ music, or for example, in the proportions um, in the E flat um, major prelude and fugue, which you um, mentioned. Okay, there's a there seems to be a whole. I'm not sure if I can answer your question, but there seems to be this uh, in Bach's music, in Bach's notational practice. He seems to be switching in the last 15 years of his life, give or take, um, towards. Uh, precisely notating speed, tempo in proportion to notating more precisely affect. So that is one of the reasons, um, for example, uh, one of the reasons I think is why he made the changes he did in the later art of the fugue um, to more closely uh, indicate the affect of the speed. He still, he still indicated the speed quite, um, quite uh, precisely, but the affect changes um, I know what I, the, the overview that I just presented also it was, it sounds a little bit rigid, but actually, um, then that's kind of like the infrastructure, but then everything else, once you take everything else, uh, with it, like steel is fantastic is on top of that. You take, uh, um, so many different other aspects that the, the system becomes very complex and, and very malleable and, um, something where, where, um, where your individual preference comes from. And I was just trying to find this uh, quote that I found from Roger North that I included at the end uh, of my book. Um, and he says, for pro uh, as for chrono chronometers by pendulum clockwork, some of, uh, of which some are so fond, they are so very whimish that the success will not answer, but pour, put more out than in. And how should occasional shifting of time be catched when time will be required to adjust the instrument, 
If such a device be good for anything, it is to regulate the private practicer, but for consort, there is nothing like a roll of paper in hand of the artist without noise and above board. So I, I keep finding within the sources themselves that this, I know this is Roger North, this is not German, not German Baroque, um, but I keep finding in the sources there's always this tension between rules and personal interpretation. Matheson, you find this as well. Um, and so this is always, uh, so you, you, you have the rules at one, on one side, but then you find a thousand ways to, to fudge those rules. Yeah, great. I think so we... That... Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, we, we find this, uh, you know, this problem with, with, with things mechanical, uh, with clockwork and, and so on. Um, uh, quite, I, I, I don't know, you, you perhaps you know uh, Daniel Friderizzi, you know, who, who says that some people beat the time beat time uh, like a clockwork and uh, right. and this is there in error, he says. Mm, uh, correct. For example, and I, think is, that, I is, think that is very much that is very much in, in line with almost every writing that I that I've come across with. I mean you have you have the rules but then then you know it's it's kind of you learn the rules but then you just forget them. And and you do your you, you be a musician in, in that in that sense. Yeah, exactly. I mean, this is, I think it's also connected with, you know, um, um, musical notation. I mean, notated music uh, is a document, so I think, you know, um, different criteria uh, apply to, to documents than they do for performance. Unless right. performance is recorded, of course, and this is why uh, we have Inya. And, uh, but before, uh, before that, uh, do we have any other questions? I think we better go on now. Okay, so, um, so we, we, we are so happy, um, as I mentioned, Inya um, has been working on, on early recording technologies and how they've influenced uh, perf performer, performance, and this is a, a, of a really great interest to me. And I'm really looking forward to, to your presentation. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you everybody for being here. Hello to all the viewers. Um, I will now start sharing my presentation. So just bear with me for a moment. I hope you can see it. Uh, and I will just, yeah. Okay, super. So. Uh, uh, wait, 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 store, sorry, I, I, okay, I think that I will have to um, uh, just do this again, I think that I mi mix something up, um, give me a moment, please, uh, I need to start sharing again, um, sorry about this, okay, so, uh, unfortunately, I will have to share it like this, uh, so, a couple of things uh, about, uh, uh, how I got to this uh, stage to try to understand mechanical recording technologies is that uh, it's very similar to what Julia just said, that we as uh, the musicians, we are taught certain things and then we have to kind of do them, yes? And uh, when we do them, we kind of uh, rely on our instincts a lot and uh, the style in which we are doing them is very much influenced by the time where we live in, in which we live in. And uh, for me, early sound recordings were really fascinating because uh, they are uh, witnessing a completely different style and a completely different attitudes towards, uh, towards tempo, tempo mod modifications and tempo rubato. So um, uh, one short example how an early recording could sound like is something like this. So you can see 
very, very different sound world from what we are used to nowadays. Um, when I started my research project, which was just about the mechanical recording uh, technologies, uh, I was really interested in all, all the aspects which are influencing our performance when we are recording. Um, so uh, I uh, did couple, more than couple, uh, uh, the, the, like something like uh, the recording sessions, uh, and we used um, uh, phonographs, we used uh, also discs. Uh, this is the list of my equi uh, equipment. Uh, in order to understand uh, how uh, how much does this technology influences uh, a performance? The, in the same time, while we were doing uh, recording sessions with uh, the mechanical recording technologies, uh, the, the the sessions were also covered digitally, and uh, afterwards they, the the findings were analyzed. So a couple of photos to, uh, to show, show you how this looks like. This is a, a cylinder. In the first presentation today, I will talk a little bit more about cylinders. And in the second, I will talk about discs because there are different, different types. Even though they are mechanical recording technologies, they are a little bit different. Um, and the way how you record is different. Uh, so this is obviously a wax cylinder. Uh, this is one of the, 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 the a piece of equipment we are using to measure the, um, uh, this one here is a little laser we are using to measure the speed of the cylinder uh, on a phonograph. And uh, this is me below uh, the recording uh, uh, on a grand piano. Uh, this is how some of these recording sessions looked like with the upright piano. And you can immediately see what the problems are going to be. Yeah. So I can't see the recording person. Uh, I'm behind the piano, somebody raises their hand, I have to go, yeah? So uh, the cylinders at that time, uh, the, uh, we used like amateur technologies, uh, they are two minutes long only. And there are two main problems with cylinder recordings. Uh, is that first of all, they're only two minutes long <laughs> and you can actually just record that much and you are constantly constantly aware that you will run out of time every time you slow down, every time you try to do something very musical, very natural, is going, you have to make it up if your piece is, of course, around the same, same length. Um, the other thing which is really important to say about the cylinders is that everything has to play, be played very, very, very loudly. And this is something which directly influences the performer uh, in, in the context of performance, in the context how you will actually react to the music. So a uh, couple of more uh, photos how the, these things uh, looked like. Uh, and uh, here, so these are the, the, the lower one is a, a, a phonograph uh, a recording session. Um, and uh, one thing is really important is that the phonograph doesn't register the bass very well when it comes to piano. And if you want to have the bass registered, you have to really, 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 really play the left hand really loudly. And uh, basically your left hand is louder than your right hand, which feels very unnatural. That's one thing. The second thing is that everything has to be loud let's say from mezzo forte up there is no if if you go below the below the kind of general mezzo forte dynamics uh it will not get registered uh so you are really really tied your hands are tied in context of dynamics and expression and where do you find that expression if you can't go uh on to piano um as a <laughs> as an obvious uh, thing to do uh, when you're trying to be expressive, where do you find it? You find it in rhythm. And basically, uh, a, uh, when I recorded uh, on phonograph together with my colleagues, uh, people really did tend to uh, stretch and play more, uh, uh, play more with rhythmical uh, freedom 
uh, than usually because this is where you can actually express yourself. Um, so uh, I will just show very, very quickly, uh, not my own recording, but a recording of a colleague, Sebastian Bausch, who was uh, recording uh, with me and uh, Peter Hill and Laura Granero, who I saw on, on chat today. So hi, Laura. Um, so this is Mazurka, what we all recorded. Uh, and this is how it sounds on a wax cylinder. I'm sorry to cut it. It's so, so, so wonderful, but uh, we have to move on. So one of uh, I wanted to share some musicians' observations about that because the thing is that we don't have this so many observations from the original, <laughs> like performing musicians from the late 19th century and the early 20th century. So we can't really uh, understand completely what it was all about until we experiment with the actual actual recording sessions and put ourselves. Uh, through that. And uh, one thing which I would like to point out here is thumping out the bass notes is definitely against my instincts. You are doing things which feel wrong. It felt like I'm accompanying a primary school choir, which is really, really how you feel. It's very, very upside down with how, act, how you would uh, play. And uh, this especially goes for something which is mazurka, no nocturne, cantilena type, of, of recordings. Some more uh, observations, and I will wrap up now, um, is that uh, Laura said that she had to play with more weight, uh, and uh, but that she's sure if you train to record like this, that it's possible to play in this manner and feel fine. This is also true. I recorded a, a, a large number of time and a, a, a times, and every time I record, it becomes easier and easier and more natural to me. Um, which is, again, very normal. Um, uh, the, this strange experience uh, is really uh, wonderful because you learn how to, uh, how to uh, listen to the early recordings and uh, to see why this tempo changes, uh, uh, use of metrical rubato, dislocations in the piano playing, even though we are using them when we are talking about uh, historic informed performance practice, when you start recording, you are using them in slightly different manner uh, when you're in the room and they register in slightly different manner again, which I will pick up on that in our next talk. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you so much. Um, this is fascinating. Um, I see, uh, yeah, Alexander, uh, applause from Alexander, uh, and, but we'll, we'll now go on, I think, um, with, with Jet, Jet Wentz, um, with more about sub, uh, subjectivity and, uh, affect in, in the 18th century, in the light of Aaron Hill's The Art of Acting. Um, hello, Jet. Hello, thank you very much. Let me just uh, do the screen share here. Oops, that's not the right button, sorry. So, um, I uh, am actually no longer really, I don't really consider myself a musician anymore. I've been more or less uh, stopped playing entirely. Uh, but I began looking at this entire topic because I was interested in what acting could tell us about music. And now I find that I'm actually looking at it to see what music can tell us about acting. So I, I have a very um, 
reverse view of, of things than I did, let's say, 15 years ago when I started. I'm going to talk for about 10 with uh, musical sources. Uh, it's very funny, I'm hearing a lot of things that I can only agree with from my colleagues, so I think that in many ways we are all on the same uh, page. <clears throat> Just in order to um, make a link with music, I will, however, start with a quotation from uh, Kiernberger. He says, the composer must never forget that every melody should be a true and natural illustration or depiction of an emotional state or feeling, insofar as that can be painted by a sequence of notes. The name Gemütsbewegung, which we Germans give to the passions or affects, indicates its similarity to movement. Bewegung means movement, but we often translate it as tempo. Indeed, each passion and each feeling has, both in its inner effect and in speech, wherein it manifests itself, its faster or slower, more violent or more peaceful movement, bewegung, tempo. And the composer must properly hit upon this movement, bewegung, tempo, according to the nature of the feeling that he is to express. Therefore, I must first remind the budding composer that he should industriously study every passion and feeling in terms of movement, bewegung, tempo, in order not to fall into the grave error of giving the melody a slow movement where it must be quick, or a quick one where it must be slow. This is, however, a study that lies outside of music and which the composer shares with the poet and the orator. So this is, for me, a very clear link between tempo and the act of um, speaking in public or indeed acting on the stage. And this is what I'm exploring today. Uh, before I continue, I must first define what I mean by passion or affect uh, that I here define as emotions so strong as to cause perceptible changes to the body and voice of the person feeling the emotion. If you cannot perceive in me any change, I am not in a passion. Such changes were known as the characteristics of the passions, for instance, sighing, weeping, heripilation, goosebumps, uh, going pale, blushing, turning red, trembling, etc. These are the visible signs of the passions, but there were also audible ones that uh, changed the voice, and they're particularly important for the actor, but I would also argue for the musician as well. Now, who was Aaron Hill? Aaron Hill was <clears throat> someone very much associated with the theater in London. He was very briefly the manager in Drury Lane, and he was also responsible for uh, Handel's Rinaldo in uh, 1711, but I would not argue that he's someone that we really should think of as a musical person. He was really a poet and a playwright. He was coaching actors professionally as well, actors who were appearing on the London stage, and he was the author of the theatrical articles in The Prompter, which was a newspaper he was largely responsible for publishing. Uh, what I want to talk about today is his essay on the art of acting. He was busy with this topic throughout his career. It appears in his letters. It appears in The Prompter, in his essays. It appears in poems that he published. But it is particularly this work, which is a prose work, that uh, I want to discuss today, an essay on the art of acting which was published in 1753 after his death and is in fact not complete. It was incomplete at the moment of his death. I think because he just gave up trying to explain it properly. He had been trying for his whole life and he never really managed to explain it very clearly. Um, and then this, this uh, final prose version was republished three times, um, the last in 1821, but that's a very uh, reworked uh, version. A lot of it has been changed by that point. So, what he wants in this text is to help actors find affect when on the stage. And it's very clear that he thinks that the first way to do this is through the imagination. You must imagine strongly uh, uh, who you are, where you are, and what you're feeling. He says, to act a passion well, the actor never must attempt its imitation till his fancy has conceived so strong an image or idea of it as to move the same impressive springs within his mind, which form that passion when it is undesigned and natural. 
this is something that can be found in various uh, acting treatises and rhetorical treatises, that one tricks the body. And this is why actors speak about feeling and not feeling at the same time. One feels that the body is activated, but one does not actually feel the passion. And this is achieved by uh, the imagination. He gives a four-part uh, scheme. First, the imagination must conceive a strong idea of the passion. Secondly, but that idea cannot strongly be conceived without impressing its own form upon the muscles of the face. So if it's not showing up in your face, you have not strongly enough conceived of it. Thirdly, nor can the look be muscularly stamped without communicating instantly the same impression to the muscles of the body. And as it moves through the body, of course, it passes the vocal cords, and that is how it changes the voice. Fourthly, the muscles of the body, braced or slack, as the idea of an active or a passive, is an active or a passive one, must, in their natural and not to be avoided consequence, by impelling or retarding the flow of the animal spirits, transmit their own conceit sensation to the sound of the voice and the disposition of the gesture. So what happens is the imagination causes the animal spirits, which they conceived as uh, being the, the particles which move the muscles. They came down through the nerves and actually moved the muscles. Uh, they would be uh, impelled or retarded. They would be active or passive, and the muscles would therefore be braced or slack according to the nature of the passion. And of course, rage would be more braced, more uh, uh, engaged than melancholy, which would be uh, quite slack. As to the reason of all this, it is as clear as the consequence. For these are nature's own marks and impressions on the body in cases where the passion is produced by involuntary emotions. You will not see a difference when the actor does it well between an involuntary characteristic of the passions and a voluntary one because he or she has ignited in the body all of those activities which would naturally take place. And when natural impressions are imitated exactly by art, the effect of such art must seem natural. So the art is in triggering the natural characteristics of the passions in the actor's face, voice, and gesture. Uh, now he gives 10 dramatic passions, which he says are the ones that are really uh, discreetly discernible on the stage. So you can tell all of these easily ap apart from each other. They're, 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 they're clear enough in their characteristics to be acted in their pure form, and they can all be mixed. And at the end of the treatise, he has love mixed with every one of these passions. So it is not some kind of rigid, uh, intellectual system. It really is a very um, subjective one. And the way that he does this is he brings uh, together the imagination, the muscles of the body, whether they're slack or tense, which has to do with the animal spirits, and the quality of the eye. So in anger, you have intense muscles and a frown in the eye. And in fear, you have languid muscles, languid eye, or sorry, languid look and muscles but with alarm in uh, the eye and your gestures will be uh, alarmed. Now, I don't have time to demonstrate these, maybe in question time or later on in the thing, I can demonstrate one or two of them. Um, it's very interesting because one can trigger the uh, characteristics in this manner. He says, but still, this caution, let the thinking actor forever take care to remember that he is not to begin to utter even so much as a single word till he has first reflected on and felt the idea, and then adapted his look and his nerves to express it. But as soon as this pathetic sensation has strongly and fully imprinted his fancy, let him then, and never a moment before, attempt to give the speech due utterance so shall he always hit the right and touching sensibility of tone and move his auditors impressingly. Whereas, should he with an unfeeling volubility of cadence 
hurry on from one overleaped distinction to another without due adaption of his look and muscles to the meaning proper to the passion he will never speak to hearts nor move himself nor any of his audience beyond the simple and unanimating verbal sense without the spirit of the writer so he's saying if you do not stop first to feel you cannot move anyone the actor must stop, must sense his own body, must feel it himself, and then he can begin to speak. Otherwise, he will only give the unanimating verbal sense. That's like us playing the score when we're musicians, as far as I'm concerned. And just to finish up, and yet all such beautiful and pensive pausing places will at the same time appear to an audience, but the strong and natural attitudes of thinking and the inward agitations of a heart that is in truth disturbed and shaken. So they look natural because the body is shifting gears. Whereas the glib, round, rolling emptiness of an unpausing in insignificance in speaking, far from painting or resembling nature, represents no image at all to a discerning audience, but that of a full player's memory pouring out its overmeasure with no meaning from a voice that neither touches nor is touched by character. So the actor's words are timed by the inner experience of the passions as they manifest themselves in the actor's body and imagination. Pauses at effective transition points are essential in order for the transition to appear natural, which is to say embodied. That's my talk for now. Thank you. Thank you, Jed. Um, who wants to start? Are we speechless? Indeed we are. Um, actually, com coming back to um, what Inia was talking about, um, I, think, I think it's interesting thought that, that, that um, on the early recordings they, they felt the need to exaggerate uh, rhythmical aspects, because as we heard, or did rather did not hear from the from the um, early technique recordings, then there is so, such a lot that we, we miss. But later, we, we are actually actually used to be told to moderate our expression on, on the recordings because they are going to be listened to repeatedly. <laughs> did this change? At a, well, it. it it clearly, clearly did, but, but can we point, point the finger to, to what were the um, reasons and the chronology of, of this kind of attitude change? Well, I, I don't know about the chrono chronology, but I think that the attitudes towards music were much, much, they were radically different than ours. And then when you think about recordings, um, I recently did some uh, a study on uh, really early GNT gramophone recordings, which were made in in beginning of the uh, 20th century in, in London. It was like 1900s, yeah. And then when you see, uh, I mean, people played wrong notes, the, nothing was uh, uh, changed. They would play, they would record, and then they would go away, wait, because for discs you need to wait for days for the discs to be developed. So you can't hear back what you did. This is, this is a, a difference what I will uh, talk about in next talk. Um, uh, wax cylinders, especially the two, se uh, two, mil uh, seconds, <laughs> two minute ones, you can, uh, you can hear back immediately, which makes you, uh, you're in a good position as a musician. You play and then you hear back what you did and you're like, oh, okay, wait a second, I can fix that. And uh, it's just, it's like you have to translate what you're doing to what is, uh, what gets registered, which is really a normal thing that every musician does even nowadays. <laughs> nowadays. Uh, so uh, it's just with wax, it's just that translation is like further distance from what you're doing. Uh, and uh, when you see these discs, they get uh, developed, like if they have to make a stamp and then they uh, make uh, copies and then you come back after two weeks or 10 days as a performer and you listen back your, what you did and a number of times they would sit down and play it again because they were not uh, happy with what they heard. So you have the, uh, uh, the recording sessions dates 
uh, you can see that the, like if they would re uh, record like four compositions in one day and then 10 days later they would uh, often repeat two compositions and add three more or two more and then continue like that so uh, there was um, uh, 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 an understanding what they want to produce, definitely. And, uh, but what they wanted to produce is not, um, I, I would dare to say, was not so, it was not similar to our understanding of, of, of music because wrong notes were fine, changing tracks was fine. Uh, it, it was really about, was the recording successful? in the context, can you hear everything, yeah? And uh, does it kind of have a spark in a way? Is it interesting? And a lot of these recordings are really fascinating uh, tonally and uh, rhythmically and musically. Uh, and if you play it to your students right now, what I did in conservatory setting, they would say, they made a mistake. <laughs> and I'm like, that's not a mistake. <laughs> it's just somebody's playing, you know? It's one of the greatest pianists ever. And you're talking, oh, no, no, I don't think that that was played like that. And I'm like, oh, God, they see it as bad. <laughs> they actually see it as bad. Yeah, so I find it fascinating. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Apo actually has now suggested a question that's also of great concern to me. And this uh, concerns, you know, a live performance uh, versus recording at this early period, I mean, what I hear uh, a lot is because these early recordings for, to us, they sound uh, really like live performances with the, you know, with mistakes, with the liberties uh, people take and so on, uh, but we don't really have many um, li live recordings, I mean, real concept recordings, because I'm sure that performers were very well aware that this is being rec recorded and this will that this will remain on record forever. Um, but, and I always thought one should examine um, those recordings which are, let's say, less formal. And I think you, uh, you know, you were, um, you took the Julius Block cylinders as, as one of your, uh, it's, it's, it's your focus, I think. And are they somehow less formal than, than studio recordings, let's say? Uh, definitely, but you have to understand that it's like, so Block is 1890s, yeah, 1891. So Block got the phonograph from Edison very, very early. And then he started to record, uh, you know, on dinner parties, uh, on, in the academy, the, like just really, really nonchalant way of, of recording. And there are recordings which are wax cylinders which are really different than what you would expect, how they sound like, because people actually didn't think about the mistakes. I remember that one of my favorite uh, block cylinders is, is Anna Yesipova um, playing uh, Godard's Gavotte, and then she plays wonderfully, wonderfully, and okay, she makes some mistakes, it doesn't matter, P wonderful playing at the end, if you listen carefully, you can hear her dying of laughter, saying in Russian, oh, I really messed this up, <laughs> and this is just really great, and this is the only, only wax cylinder we have from her, uh, and she's just so honest, you know, how many times did you play something, and you're, you're like, oh, God, <laughs> <laughs> that was really no. Oh, I want to do it again, you know. And uh, and I like that honesty about the amateur cylinders. I think that this is a complicated question because the amateur cylinders were only in one part of the uh, late the 90s of the 19th century, and the the, the the technological technological developments were really rapid. And uh, by already by uh, uh, 10 years later, you have first studios. So I think that, um, you know, these field recordings and everything, they are much um, more rare. There is a block, of course, in Russia. There is another, another uh, study from a colleague of mine, uh, Dr. Eva Moreda uh, Rodriguez, about Spanish recordings, which were amateur. And so there are a couple of these you know, banks of this amateur, uh, what Americans would say, home recordings, uh, and uh, you, you can access those. And I could suggest maybe Santa Barbara uh, University Cylinder, 
the, the depository is unbelievable and they have a lot of home recordings which sound a little bit different. Yeah, okay. I would just uh, say, you said that, that they were uh, having fun, and, and but Anton Rubinstein, he, he didn't have fun, he didn't want to play because he was afraid of making mistakes. Um, yeah. So, I don't know, does any of our um, guests have a question or are there questions in on YouTube chat? Yes, we have one question to, to Jed, that is from Moika Gal, asking, um, uh, that was so interesting, any hints of using the same principles for dance pantomime for opera singers, or does it mainly apply to actors? I, I, I think one has to experiment with it. Um, it was meant for actors and uh, some of the results are very uncontrolled in the body. So uh, I don't know that it's, it's not good for musicians. It's really full body uh, affect, which makes it very difficult, I think, to play properly or even be in time at all. Uh, and I would su suspect that uh, using it in its pure form would, would have the same effect for dance or pantomime, that you, you're no longer in enough control. Um, to what extent one really needs to use this on stage, of course, is, is the further question. And it is a way of finding affect, uh, but one doesn't need to use it um, unless it's really, really necessary. I mean, Aaron Hale basically says, if your imagination is working, that's fine. And his bringing in the body uh, is only if you're on stage and you get stuck and you find that you're not um, hitting the affect correctly. So we need to experiment. Okay, thank you. Um, I think we ought to move on. And the next thing will be my little, my old presentation. Uh, I will say something on 18th century tempos in general. Uh, in my, from my own practical experience as a music, musician, trying to um, understand the language and the notation of the 18th century composers and, and put them to practice uh, in incorporate the, the my, my, my own understanding, understanding of that music. music. So two, two things, things I, 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 I come to realize are, are first that most composers were actually quite meticulous and systematic in the way they indicated the tempo, instead of just leaving the tempo relationships to musical common sense. And the second, that most performers today practically ignore these indications, just or uh, rather observe them in a rather intuitive way. So I've, I, I've spent some, some, some time in, in my actual musical practice to, to see where, where this kind of thinking might bring me. Um, I did, let's divide the 18th century to two halves for convenience and let's start with the, with the early uh, 18th, 18th century. It was generally the, the time signatures that were used to indicate the tempo. So, for example, 3-8 uh, has a faster beat than 3-4, which is again faster than 3-2. This is the, the very general uh, principle. The Italian tempo words like Allegro, Adagio, etc., they were used to modify that basic speed of the meter sign. However, generally speaking, even Adagio or Largo in 3-4 would not be as slow as the basic um, tempo giusto, or what you will, in 3-2. And many 18th century composers used uh, literally dozens of these different tempo meter signs, more, more than at any other period, like we saw in um, uh, Julia Doctor's uh, presentation. It's quite a complicated system. So we have three basic parameters. One is the basic speed, and their uh, tempo relationships are often visualized as a pyramid. But for me, it's, it's actually more useful to think of an hourglass, like this, where the center of that hourglass is the average basic uh, tempo ordinario, so to speak, in, in, in C. And, and this, is, this is a helpful starting point, because most research is relatively unanimous that this center, this, this 
normal sea tempo was somewhere in the area of let's say 60 to 80. Um, whereas depending on, on, on the angle of the hourglass as we go faster and, and slower or of the, of, of the pyramid how fast it gets faster and how slow are the slower tempo so there we can see styli stylistic differences already in the 18th century sources and there are certainly differences in interpreting the sources today so the divergences are bigger the further we get from the center of the hourglass in either very slow or very fast then uh, how much the tempo works affect the actual speed and how much just the, the general character of, and texture so the range of possibilities on that front is, is yet another question. Um, now my practical point is that by carefully comparing a certain composer's use of meter signs and tempo indications um, there emerges a surprisingly nuanced picture and it is usually possible to define the possible range of tempos by comparing, by trying in a way that, that follows the logic in the way the tempo was indicated by the composers. Um, perhaps we could now have a look at the number one a picture that is, I believe that the YouTube watchers now have the, um, can see a possible example of triple time signatures by Johann Zonleitner. This example is, is uh, on the slow side, it has metronome numbers indicated and with a very modest angle of, of the pyramid. In other, other words, in the slow part they are, let's say, close to what we could say are average research indications. In the central part they are slightly on the slow side, but as like I said, um, within the limits of, of general understanding of the of the normal C tempo and the faster you go the, the relatively speaking slower it gets but this is an example of a, of a logic by the meter signs and this kind of analysis is in a way simple and it is quite different from just going by intuition it, it often leads to quite different results in practice Okay, so this was the early 18th century. Now, uh, during, during the 18th century, the, the importance of the actual tempo words increased. And let's change now to number two. This is a possible tempo pyramid, or it is, we could say, this is the tempo pyramid for Mozart's Don Giovanni. This is by Nicolas Arnaud. So we can see... Um, Again, we, we can see dozens of different, not, not, not so many different meter signs anymore, but dozens of different verbal tempo indications. And in Viennese classics, it's, it usually becomes more instructive to visualize a tempo pyramid, I find, based on the tempo words, rather than a, a, an hourglass based on the meter signs. And there, with, with composers, those composers who did mark their tempos carefully and logically, if one wants to respect all those indications, there's actually very little leeway in choosing the, the actual tempo, because like, like in Don Giovanni, or let's, let's move to number three now. This is a possible tempo pyramid I used myself. It's for uh, Leopold Kozelov's opera uh, Gustav Vasa, which I had the joy of conducting the, the, the modern premiere three years ago. Um, if we actually want to have a, have a significant difference between, between all those shades of uh, Poco Andante, um, and, Andantino, uh, Andante, uh, Piu Andante, um, it actually leads to maximum tempos in the fast, fastest, fastest point and, 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 and to really slow tempos in the slow slow side. There is no... no I, I, I see very little practical, practical uh, leeway left in, in, in choosing those, the actual, actual speeds. 
Okay, now I, I would like to show some examples from Bach's works. So, going back to the age of meter signs, we have in the Volta Carietes Clavier, we have, for example, <laughs>
have a larger, um, more steep angle of the pyramid, it could be considerably slower. In the B minor mass, we have the Curia fugue, which is exactly the same, C largo. <laughs> much slower. For example, in the B minor mass we have uh, 18 carnatus in, in 3-4. Even if we accept a slow interpretation of the, of the actual speeds in triple time, which we saw in the, in, the, what, in the first examples, and even if we think of uh, something like a larghetto here, it's, it can still hardly be less than, than this, around 60. Um, but then after this comes the crucifixus, which is 3, 2, so therefore slower. <laughs>
So, this was a short interlude, and we will now continue with our early recordings. Um, Inya discussed um, cylinders in her, the first part of, of her talk, and um, there is a second part now um, which speaks about uh, discs. Uh, just a moment that I upload this. Uh, uh, give me a moment. And this one, I think I can. Oh. Okay. So, uh, I did recently last year. I did a, a continuation in, in, in my in my research project. Uh, uh, I focused on discs, and uh, discs are. Uh, <laughs> I focused on 10 inch discs. I did some seven inch as well. Uh, 10 inch discs because that's the machinery we could actually build and use. And um, so we wanted to uh, uh, focus on something, uh, you know, I, I tried to think, okay, so this is the technology which I have, but I have a different instrument from the same age, but I was trying to uh, like be a devil, devil's advocate to my own research and ask myself as many questions as I can to see uh, which aspects of performance I can actually cover historically correct uh, on, you know, the, the, as you can uh, think about correctness in this, in this uh, aspect. So uh, a, a colleague of mine, Yeroen Billier, uh, and me uh, teamed up and his project, Brave Belgians, uh, he's a horn player from Ghent. Um, we, uh, we wanted to recreate, recreate, it's a very loose term here. We wanted to record together uh, one a, a couple of pieces made by this uh, uh, a Ghentian uh, player called um, Helbrek, Charles Helbrek, because we had something really interesting. We had a horn he used in the original recording, uh, which you can see, which is a little bit different than uh, the usual horns of the time. We had a, a upright piano, which is completely like the same age, like uh, the one which was used in recording. And the most importantly, we had an actually uh, original recording, original disc to use. So, uh, um, this is what the original disc uh, sounded like. Uh, I want to just uh, point out that when it comes to discs, it's a can of worms because uh, you need to know in which speed to play them. You need to know how to make the transfers and to just to take the transfers from online or something. It's always really difficult because you don't know how actually the transfers were produced. Um, so to actually be in a position that I can dictate how the, uh, the uh, not me personally, but that, that we can actually uh, uh, set the values, how we are going to do the transfers of the original disc and make it in the same day when our discs were produced uh, so the, the the sound levels are actually very very similar that was really meaningful so this is the original disc i hope you can hear this Okay, and the second side of this disc is this. Serenade. Okay. 
uh, sorry, I, I touched something <laughs> and I stopped it by accident. Uh, so here is what how how the recording session looked like. Uh, you can actually imagine how how much trouble we had to go through uh, to record horn uh, using a recording horn. <laughs> that is very very uh, difficult. And Yeroen had to uh, have a lot of tests in order to see which uh, which uh, the positions would be. Uh, fine. Uh, the good thing about this uh, uh, the, uh, the horn and piano ensemble is that the horn player was actually standing so I could actually see him, which is not the case when I would record. Uh, uh, just uh, uh, last week I recorded with a cellist and the cellist is behind the piano so I can just see the top of their head, which is very, very difficult in the context of the uh, ensemble communication. So these are our observations uh, that uh, how, how much we were influenced by the physicality of the recording um, uh, process and uh, how, uh, uh, how the recording conditions seem to enhance the effects uh, of different portamental slurs in the horn part or the asynchrony between the hands in the piano part. So in this context, I wanted to uh, just add a couple of things. Uh, with the new technologies which started to appear at like 1899-ish uh, and uh, the, the, the things which I'm using were like like 1905. Um, so uh, the discs, uh, you again still have to uh, take in mind everything what I said about the recording processes with the wax cylinders, but uh, uh, everything is a little bit less pronounced. So the technology started to be a little bit more responsive to people's playing. So you don't need to bash out your left hand, for instance, so much as you have to when it comes to the different type of wax in the, with the wax cylinders. Uh, so uh, uh, there were uh, still the same set of limitations, but uh, it's a little bit more relaxed to, to do it. This is what we produced. This is really uh, uh, basically the kind of a failed recording, but I find it because of that very, very interesting. So this is how we sound like. And the second piece. Okay, so this is really interesting. So this is where I wanted, that's why I chose this, this recording session uh, to, to show you this. So the top one, uh, Hale Breck, 1914, uh, you can see how long it is. We listen to this recording gazillion times really just to just to kind of absorb uh, we were not imitating it of course but just want to be uh, absorbed in the uh, the performance techniques and everything uh, when we rehearsed we played it really slowly very 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 uh, re in a relaxed tempo which uh, again uh, Hillbreck also used when the recordings uh, started being uh, completely aware that we will run out of time now discs have three minutes and 15 exactly. So we had 10 in inch disc and it's exactly long as how much the piece is long. And we sped up. It's just, we didn't know that we did that. We really, really didn't know because we were very happy with our performance. We were like, okay, we are done for today. And in 10 days time, when we actually heard the, the, the disc, uh, the playback, we were in shock, both of us. In a way, how, how is this so fast? Why did we go so fast? And this is one of these this, um, understandings of the tempo and how, how your listening and reaction is influenced uh, uh, by uh, by technologies. This is Van der Hagen. It was a little bit better because it was kind of 
uh, again, 315, just exact amount of time. And uh, so it's slightly faster tempo. So it was, uh, I guess, easier to, to just go into it. And these are all our frequency dynamic ranges. Um, uh, which are uh, different from our recordings. Very, they are actually very, very similar. Uh, and uh, I will just now stop sharing to do the conclusion. Uh, the okay, yes, uh, I can't. Uh, Somebody, I can't reply on YouTube uh, comments for some reason because I think that I, I'm the, in the same time streaming in Zoom and on YouTube. So it just does, I'm typing and it doesn't want to um, kind of submit my answer. Somebody asked about uh, Pachman being representative. He's not, but uh, there are not many people who would be representative. Tempo modifications are very, very personal extremely personal and you can't say this is how it was done no it's the whole attitude is a representative i'm talking about the rhythm and the tempo and different attitudes to them and i can't take one performer to say this is how it was done but nobody knows that because i do it in a different way than somebody else it's extremely subjective and that's the whole beauty of it and uh, trying with these uh, uh, early machines, uh, uh, it just taught me to be much more uh, open-minded and how to listen to these things. And uh, hopefully this will open an, a new understanding that not everything is how we see it and not everything is how we hear it. So I hope this helped <laughs> in that. <laughs> Thank you very much. Now let's let's move on to and, and um, Jet Jet Wentz from from Utrecht has more to say on Aaron Hill. Or does he? <laughs> Sorry, I'm coming. I'm coming. Uh, just pushing all the wrong buttons here. There I am. Uh, by the way, I don't live in Utrecht. <laughs> I live in Leiden. Um, Anyway, place doesn't doesn't matter. Here we go. All right. So I'm going to uh, pick up where I left off. Sorry, that's completely wrong. Sorry. Here we are. Uh, so I have to do a little recap so we get everything in our minds again. So uh, let me just quickly recap. We started with Kimberger. The composer must never forget that every melody should be a true and natural illustration or depiction of an emotional state or feeling, every melody, insofar as that can be painted by a sequence of notes. The name Gemütsbewegung, which we Germans give to the passions or affects, indicates its similarity to tempo, movement, Bewegung. Indeed, each passion and each feeling has both in its inner effect and in speech wherein it manifests itself, its faster or slower, more violent or more peaceful movement. And the composer must properly hit upon this movement according to the nature of the feeling he is to express. Therefore, I must first remind the budding composer that he should industriously study every passion and feeling in terms of tempo in order not to fall into the grave error of giving the melody a slow movement where it must be quick or a quick one where it must be slow. This is, however, a study that lies outside of music and which the composer shares with the poet, poet and orator. And we saw in Aaron Hill's, uh, Aaron Hill's uh, acting treatise, or I'm going to try to demonstrate that there is common ground between the disciplines of music and oratory in embodiment. Um, Aaron Hill was talking about the feeling of the body as the animal spirits activate the muscles in various ways. The actor feels when the body is ready for the next affect. Music, oratory, and acting shared this physical understanding of how emotions were generated and expressed in the body. And in order to discuss this, I'm going to look at Matheson. So I have some quotations from Kapellmeister. And here, this is the chapter in which he discusses um, the, uh, the physics, the natural science of sound, uh, where he basically goes through the affects. Since, for example, joy is felt through a spreading out of our animal spirits, 
is felt through a spreading out of our animal spirits, it follows logically and naturally that I can best express this affect through wide and distant intervals. If one knows on the contrary that sorrow is a contraction of such subtle particles of our body, so it is easy to appreciate that narrow and the narrowest intervals are the most suitable to this passion. When we consider that love is actually based on a scattering of spirits, so we would be reasonable to aim for this in composition and get to work with uniform proportions of sound. Hope is an elevation of feeling or spirits. Desperation, a complete collapse of the same. These are just things that allow themselves to be very naturally represented with sounds. Above all, when the other factors, especially tempo, Zeitmasse, play their part. And in this manner, one can form a sensual idea of all the emotions and form one's inventions to it. So the feeling of joy is the spreading of the animal spirits, which is activating the muscles in a particular way. And we feel that activation, just as we feel in sorrow, a very different kind of activation. And I think we can all uh, imagine that in joy, the tempo of our speech and the tempo and the quality of our gestures is much quicker than in sorrow, when our speech will be probably lower, probably slower, and our gestures more languid. And so in this sense, uh, tempo is part of an entire package of embodiment, which is shared between the orator and the speaker. Uh, sorry, and the musician. So much more than the other passions, anyone who would represent sorrow in sound must feel and experience it himself. Otherwise, all the so-called loki topici, the commonplaces of oratory, would be useless. Now, this is really important. He says, yes, okay, we've got commonplaces. Everyone talks about the commonplaces now, as if it takes away the creativity of the composer, but the composer cannot rely on them alone, particularly for sorrow and love, he says, when you must consult your own feeling and your own experience. And that feeling is also a physical one. We do not wish to enter into a further expansion of this chapter on sound itself, on musical philosophy with the emotions that pertain to it, or on which form of these exact knowledge could be of use to a composer, considering that the affects particularly have just the same condition as that of a bottomless sea, so that however much trouble one might take to draw up something complete about them, only the minimum would be completed. Endless amounts, however, would be left unsaid and should be left to each individual's own natural receptivity. And I'm translating empfindung here, not as sentiment, because we have the wrong associations with that word. I would argue that by empfindung, they mean the ability to feel and feel very finely. So if there is not here a complete um, call for subjectivity on the part of the musician, and this is on the part of the composer, of course, but I really reject the argument that the composer must be subjective and the performer somehow objective, because that is absolutely not what Aaron Hill is saying for the actors. The actors have to take the poet's words and make them their own. And I would say that just as the actors had to feel that the body was ready, the musician must feel that the body is ready for the affect. Now this leads us to a problem. So if the affects all have their own tempo and all have their own feeling, and if it's all subjective in anything, what do we do with the courants from the Kapellmeister? Now I know that this is very well known, but it is a problem because here we have a little courants dance music of all things. And Matasun tells us that at the two stars, there's a change of affect. So the main affect is hope, but hope is built up of courage. So up until the first star, it's courage. And then between this next star and the first and the next star, it's desire. And then from the final star to the end, it's joy. So hope is made up of courage, desire, and joy, which when you take into account the re repetitions, 
you get courage, desire, courage, desire, joy, desire, joy in this little piece. Now, how are we supposed to make that clear if we don't change tempo and we don't change time? But we're not allowed to do that, one, because it's subjective, and two, because it's dance music. But here is this problem. This is our problem. So if we're going to work from embodiments, we are going to have to rethink completely uh, the way that we approach our sources. And this creates a tension between the researcher who is trying to base everything on uh, sources and the performer who must consult personal feeling. But my response to that, and it's a personal one, is that the researcher performer tries things out tries to get used to them, tries to make sense of them before they are rejected. If the musical researcher performer can integrate something into their system and start to understand it and start to create from it, perhaps we can bring the subjective and the objective, the research and the performance somewhat closer together. Now I'd like to close with uh, a reaction to this, which is the first metronome that ticked. This is Dans Ombre's Metro Metro, which is currently in the Musée des Arts et Métiers in Paris. And it was the first metronome to work on a clockwork and tick, as far as we know. Um, and Diderot writes about this and says that it was rejected because the musicians did not want to play in time. And here he says, musical connoisseurs object to all metronomes in general, that there are perhaps not four bars in an air that are of exactly the same duration. Two things necessarily contribute to slowing some down and to precipitating others. Ornamentation, he uses the word goo, so if you wanted to use taste I wouldn't fight you for it, but I think he means ornamentation, and the harmony in pieces of several parts, and ornamentation and the implied harmony in solos. A musician who knows his art, having played four bars of an air, grasps its character and abandons himself to it. Nothing more than the pleasure of the harmony suspends him. Here he wants the chords to be struck. There he wants to reveal them. This is to say that he sings or plays more or less slowly from one measure to another, and even from a beat and a quarter of a beat to that which follows. So what we have here is not a musician who sits down and analyzes the piece harmonically, or a musician who sits down and looks for rhetorical figures, or a musician who sits down and reads a treatise beforehand, or who looks at the meter sign and then looks up in various books what the meter sign could mean. He has, him, he has the musician sit, sit down, play four bars, and abandon himself to the pleasure of playing. And this is what we are not allowed to do. Now, I admit that, of course, we are not 18th century people. We need the books. We need the uh, analysis to some extent. But I think that we have given them far too great a place in our performance practice. And we have lost this simple pleasure. Not only is this let's say the actor who is getting into the affect and feeling the affect in his body. This is the performer who simply reacts to the pleasure of playing. Okay, I'm done. Thank you. Thank you, Chet. Mm. Um, I think um, it will be best at this point to move on to um, the second part of um, Yeah, of, of, of Julian. Um, so let's continue with the second, um, second, um, uh, uh, yes. Um, well, I think, well, I think we, have a, yeah. we have a, um, a similar topic because I also speak about tempo words. Now, who should, who should start, Julia or, uh, I think I have some more general remarks. Perhaps, perhaps I should I should start as as was was planned. Fine. Let's take uh, Dom um, and, and Julia, and, and yeah, then after and after that we will we will have a chance. I, I also have a um, 
I will now also share my screen. I also have some, you know, I've been looking for examples of what Jed was just explaining, you know, uh, not examples, let's say small traces of evidence uh, of, you know, changing the tempo in uh, small quantities, which means, you know, like you said, every four bars and so on. And this is quite a standard four bars. Sometimes it's two bars, but perhaps there are longer bars than the, you know, the, the two million bars that, that we, 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 we saw. Um, but, uh, well, I will, um, I would like to show some more methods here. Um, I, uh, that Composer used to indicate tempo changes in a piece. And the Spanish Wijuela repertoire is very rich on valuable information about mid 16th century performance practices. Luis Milan demands in 1536 that in certain of his fantasias for Wijuela, the chords, which are already notated in longer note values, be played with a slower beat and the runs, notated in quavers, with the quicker one. Such an approach amplifies the affect, exaggerating the contrast between slow and fast. Likewise, Vicentino, Nicola Vicentino, writing some 20 years later, implies that sad music will ideally have longer note values and a slower beat, while cheerful music will have lively diminutions in shorter note values and a faster beat. Failing to acknowledge this simple principle has led to a modern problem with tempo words. I have already mentioned one scholar noticing that a change of time signature in Bach's music may imply a change of tempo, but suggesting that the contrast of note values would, will perhaps be sufficient. It proves that 17th and early 18th century tempo words are often both in writing and in practice explained away as either confirming the notation and describing what is happening anyway, warning that one should not do the opposite or only being about character, not tempo. One modern attempt to not to have um, directions such as Allegro and Adagio mean much for tempo is emphasizing the possibility that they mainly describe character. It is suggested that adagio is sometimes spelled adagio and, ac and actually means at ease, implying a somewhat freer performance, perhaps. Similarly, allegro is translated as cheerful um, and not necessarily fast. Um, oh, but all this is arbitrary and contradicts sources such as this rule for singing pupils by Daniel Friderizzi, first published in 1618 and reprinted many times until the late 1670s. Friderizzi writes that some make the mistake to measure out the beat so strictly in a line as the clock its minutes and observe absolutely no decorum and accommodation towards the text and harmony. He explains that different musical figures and affects demand different tactus speeds and gives four examples with contrasting affect and note values, labeling them geschwind and langsam, fast and slow. So this is about the beat, about the, the changes of tactus. This example demands different speeds of tactus. Neutralizing tempo words, on the other hand, tends to produce less rather than more affect, contrast, and variety. Ideas about tempo directions only confirming the notation and warning performers abound in Irmgard Hermann Bengen's book on tempo markings published in the late 50s and are still found in her article in the New Musik in Geschichte und Gegenwart from 1998. The same beliefs are still widespread in the Performer's Guide to Music of the Baroque period published by the Associated Board of the Royal Schools of Music, we read the following. The impression that they often just described what was happening in the music is confirmed by the way they frequently accompany changes from slow to fast notes and vice versa. Here we see the opening sonata from a sacred concerto by Johann Nicolaus Hanf in the Düben collection. The tempo directions Adagio and Allegro correspond to changes of note values. The same directions are also found in the continuo part where we see no such changes of movement. And now this is an addition 
uh, of Hanf's piece from 1958 from Bernreiter, the editor explains in the preface that the bass is repeated unchanged throughout these passages. So these tempo words can only mean changes of character brought about by the note values. The explanation andante in parentheses is added to the original Allegro and Adagio markings. Well, I would not, not only suggest to take such markings seriously, but I would also try to understand them and to sometimes apply the same principles when such markings are absent. There are some less common methods of indicating tempo changes. Here is a piece for two lira vials by Simon Ives copied in the early 1630s. We see six markings, ST or LT, which may have been added by performers of the period. They correspond to changes of texture and probably stand for long time and short time. Another possibility would be lively time and slow time, but this seems to make little musical sense. It's indicative that these markings are absent from the modern edition of this piece, published in 2003. They also pass unmentioned in the critical commentary. Sometimes tempo markings are impossible to ignore or explain away. This is a page from a manuscript of John Jenkins's three-part dances in the Newberry Library in Chicago. The indication soft is often combined with the tempo direction drag, like in this example. A well-known scholar and performer specializing in this repertoire sees this as, quote, evidence that more conventional ensemble music was sometimes performed in this mannered way, though in large ensembles, the style of, the, of performance must have been much more straightforward, particularly since they were not conducted in the modern sense and there was often only a minimum of rehearsal, unquote. While such differences are indeed described in many sources, there are also the indications that more variety in tempo and dynamics was desired from larger ensembles. Substantial connections between tempo changes and dynamics are best known from 19th century music, but they seem to have been quite common in the 17th century and even earlier. Um, Michael Pretorius writes in 1619 that the indication piano suggests that the voice should not only be restrained, but should also sing more slowly. It is interesting to observe how the singular direction tocca pian piano in this lute piece by Vincenzo Capirola, written around 1517, is today invariably understood as a dynamic marking, despite the fact that it is directly preceded by a fermata suggesting that time would be broken. Tempo and dynamics are coupled in various ways in the 17th century. Here is a page from a collection by Paul Rivander, published in Ansbach in 1613. The parentheses below the music are found in all instrumental dances for four and five parts in this collection, except for the shortest ones. They're explained in the tenor part book. The passages marked in this manner are played softly and somewhat faster. One returns to the original sound and tactus when they end. In his dissertation of 1989, Ulrich Bartels uh, attributes this to Rivander's misunderstanding of effective singing of the period. Nevertheless, the changes enrich the performance, performance immensely, provided one gets hold of the right edition. Perhaps not this one from 1968, which removes all of Rivanda's markings and invents new dynamic changes instead. Daniel Gottlob Türk uses something similar in his Easy Piano Sonatas published 170 years later. His markings indicate passages that should be played in slower tempo, but they are likewise coupled with softer dynamics, piano or pianissimo. Well, these markings have not fared any better in mid 20th century editions. I hope it's clear that all indications that I presented only show very simple tempo changes. On the basis of period descriptions, one can easily imagine additional changes to those presented. 
But it seems that we have had much difficulty in coping with the written ones already. I could go on about other indications such as fermatas, capital letters and note values, but we'll just conclude here with this message I received uh, on my phone two days ago. <laughs> So um, I think uh, we now go over to Julia, sorry for the confusion beforehand. Uh, I'm looking forward to your discussion of temple works in, uh, temple words in, in late 17th century organ preludia. All right, so I'll just share my screen here. Just let me know if everything, we can see everything properly. Okay, so um, I'm going to discuss one aspect of temple words in 17th century organ preludia and Bach's equivalents. And um, this is just for the organ preludia. There, there might be instances where the, the patterns I'm going to discuss here don't apply to other repertoire types. Um, I found often that uh, it's, diff it's difficult to apply uh, principles that one gleans from one type of repertoire and, and place it into another. So this is this is just for 17th century preludia. It may um, it may uh, extend into others, but uh, for this purpose, it's just for here. So as um, Dobin discussed, there's uh, two possible tempo word functions that you can read about either in the treatises or you can have uh, find discussed in modern sources. Um, so these tempo words can either reiterate the tempo already communicated by time signatures and note values, or they can modify it. So what are we talking about uh, in terms of um, 17th century organ preludia? So first I want to talk about um, <clears throat> how tempo words can delineate still as fantastic as sections in these organ preludia. So uh, just to, I know that the definition of still as fantastic is, uh, is, is kind of confusing. But for the purposes of this present presentation and, and my book, um, I define it as those sections in the organ preludia that suddenly break into 16th or 32nd notes. Um, they have an improvisatory nature. They have a malleable tempo, uh, to use a rather 19th century term, a, a rubato type um, often. Um, and for pedal works, they often have a very extroverted nature. They're mostly in duple meter. But most importantly, because they have faster note values than the surrounding fugues, for example, that are often written in, in eighth notes. Um, the tactus tempo of these stillus fantasticus sections are slower than the surrounding sections. So, and oftentimes we see tempo words associated, used alongside of stillus fantasticus. So how do they function in conjunction in, in, in with this style of music? So let's look at Fast tempo words, for example. Um, so fast tempo words can be used to indicate the moment one exits from still is fantasticus. So here's an example from Bux Tude. Uh, at the end of the still is fantasticus section in the first two systems, you have like the, the still is fantasticus is characterized by flurries of 30 second notes. And then we have a pause at the end of the still is fantasticus. And then a new section begins with generally slower note values this means that the underlying tactus rate has to increase in order to compensate for the lower, slower note values. Um, and, then, uh, and then we have the word presto. So what is actually happening here is alongside of the more steady tempo um, and the increase of, 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 of uh, tactus rate, underlying tactus rate, we also have we, we also know that Stilus Fantasticus has a slower tactus rate. Okay. So so here is another example of this in Beckmann. The opening section, section A, um, is has a, if you play it, you'll know it, that it's, it has a very slow underlying tactus rate. Um, and uh, there's a few moments of 30 second notes, which keeps the tactus rate slow. It's a very malleable tempo. And, um, and then when we move into section B, suddenly have, we have the word allegro, which means that you increase the tactus rate to, in order to compensate for, um, 
a slower uh, slower note values in general. There are no 30 second notes in this section. And also the, 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 um, the texture changes from this malleable tempo, it changes to a much more steady tempo. It's not perfectly steady as, as, I, as we have um, discussed already in this colloquium. Um, when do you ever play metronomically, right? But it's, it's steadier uh, than, than the previous section. So, and then there is this, uh, another, we often also see slow tempo words associated with the onset of Steelers Fantasticus. So here's an example of a piece that I believe Apple has already talked about, um, Bach's, uh, one of Bach's preludes. Um, and we're at the end of the main section of this piece, we have um, the onset, the sudden onset of Steelers Fantasticus with a, an elastic pulse and like all of a sudden 64th notes as opposed to uh, 16th notes. And there's the addition of the word adagio. I think the earliest version doesn't have the word adagio, but you actually need to use this word adagio in order to, um, uh, it, it would be there, you would have to do it whether that term was there or not technically, because in order to compensate for the sudden increase uh, to 64th notes, you have to bring the tactus rate down in, in order to compensate. And so when, when you have the return to the 16th notes, um, you also have the return of the allegro. So, so, this is, um, so this is another example. This is from uh, Bach's uh, Prelude in D major, the end of it for organ. Um, at the end of this section, in strict, uh, a strict tempo section, it's often uh, labeled alla breve. Um, it has a fairly fast tempo because uh, the underlying tactus rate is fairly fast because it's moving along in, in eighth notes. And then we, we launch into the Steelus Fantasticus and we have the word adagio and that's um, to underline that, well, Steelus Fantasticus style, but also we have to compensate for those 30 second note runs. Um, we have to compensate for the malleable tempo, uh, et cetera. So this is, this, is one, this is one pattern of tempo note usage uh, that I, I found that we can, it's not always there, but it's, it's, we can find it often. So another one, this, this, is, uh, this is one that um, I believe Doman was talking about. Uh, it's similar to what Doman is talking about, but I have, I think maybe a slightly different take, maybe Doman and I can talk about that later. Um, so this is tempo words, which are often paired with, um, with fast, so fast tempo words are paired with fast note values and slow tempo words are paired with slow note values. And this is the opposite from what we just saw over here, right? Um, where a slow tempo word is paired with fast note values and a fast tempo word is paired with slow note values. So this is, this is the opposite. So here's an example of this in a Bustuda Preludium uh, where we have the adagio being indicated um, alongside this sudden drop into quarter note and half note motion. And then when it changes to eighth note and 16th note motion, we have the word allegro. So, so what's happening here? So this is from, from my understanding of the preludia technique, um, this normally without tempo words, a Baroque musician would most likely interpret such changes of note values as the needing to change the underlying tactus rate. So, um, for example, like when we saw previously, we have uh, sections of Stilus Fantasticus going into a fugue where uh, the Stilus Fantasticus is running along in 16th notes and the fugue is in eighth notes. So then when you get to the fugue in the eighth notes, you have to increase the tactus rate. Otherwise the fugue will be really, really, really too slow. So, um, so this is the, 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 what, what, we're what we see happening here. So normally without tempo words, a Baroque musician would most likely interpret such changes of note values as needing to change the underlying tactus rate. So sudden changes to slow note values meant that one would increase the tactus rate to mitigate the deceleration of speed and sudden changes to faster note values meant that one would decrease the tactus rate to mitigate the acceleration of surface speed. Therefore, when Baroque musicians add fast tempo words to fast note values and slow tempo words to slow note values, they are asking that these changes of note values do not precipitate such a drastic underlying tactus tempo change. So I'm talking about tactus tempo, I'm not talking about surface tempo. Um, so they, but they lessen, you lessen this drastic underlying tactus tempo change, or even keep the note values in their normal relationships to each other. For example, eighth notes are twice as slow as 16th notes, and you can even create even more extremes if you like. So this, this the, the idea here is that you are creating extremes in surface tempo. 
And this is to help along the drama uh, in the Preludia writing. So here's another example of this from Bustuda. Um, we have two sections on either side of this drop into uh, half notes and uh, quarter note motion mainly with the word adagio and the, the sandwiching sections are in eighth notes and, and 16th notes. So what we have two sections with a fairly fast surface speed and in the middle section, we have to make sure that we don't increase the tactus tempo. Um, so they, we have the word adagio. Now it's up to you how you interpret the word adagio. I'm not saying this is, this is uh, I've never found any reference except for one where there's, uh, I think Ripple was talking about some sort of mathematical relationship with tempo words. Um, but there's no reference, uh, there's no indication that I can tell you how much you have to keep the tactus rate slower. Um, it's just that you don't want to increase the tactus rate to compensate for the slower note values. And so of course, this is a, uh, Bach's Toccata and Fugue in D minor. I'm not going to go into um, uh, the, uh, the authorship of this piece, the attribution, um, but this is a really great uh, uh, extreme example of this. You have adagissimo ad added at the sudden cessation of note values, presto added to the sudden increase in note values, um, molto adagio to the sudden decrease in note values at the very end. So this, this and this, this piece, this section here obviously is uh, one of, is, is extremely dramatic and, um, and these sudden changes of, of uh, surface tempo are what create the drama, at least what helps create the drama. So um, I suggest that these, this adagio, adding the, adding the adagio to, um, to the, these sections that suddenly drop into slower note values was, may have been uh, in the Preludia writing, I, Doman suggested others, um, but in Preludia writing, this may have been a, a notational tradition that you just, or a performance tradition that you just understood that you don't compensate for the, for the note values in this case with a, an increase of tactus tempo change. Um, so I, I suggest that at this point in Bach's Preludium, perhaps an adagio was expected here. Now I give two, I give a, a performance indication of, uh, um, of how one would do it both ways with and without an adagio. And I think both can work, but um, it's possible that uh, the adagio was expected here. If this is a hypothesis of mine. So then the question is, um, going back to my original question, do tempo words modify or confirm um, the tempo of the, the, the spots? And I, looking at this example here that we saw previously. So adagio, is it modifying or confirming it? Well, if you're describing the underlying tactus rate, then it's modifying it. But if you're describing the service tempo, then it's confirming it. So it's always a question to me, this is one thing that came, became very clear to me, is you always have to be super clear about what you're describing in terms of tempo. Are you describing the underlying tactus rate or are you describing the surface tempo? And, it, and it's not always clear um, which parameter the treatise authors are, are describing as, as well. Um, sometimes I think they actually flip. And I actually noticed that um, in the beginning of the German Baroque, they were often describing duple meters in terms of underlying tactus rate. And at the end of the Baroque, they were uh, describing it in terms of surface tempo. So there's a shift there as well. Um, but it's always very important to understand what you're describing. Okay, and then in the final section that I wanted just to uh, briefly, uh, briefly show you one thing that I've been playing with in my book, and this might not apply to every situation. Um, so sometimes you have to calculate proportions from one section to another, in, um, but sometimes there's a tempo word involved. So uh, what do you do? How do you calculate these, these proportions when a tempo word is involved? So I come up with this, these two sort of rules, they might not apply it. They apply to the pieces uh, that I've discussed in chapter 13, but they might not be universally applied, obviously. Um, so if a tempo word confirms the surface tempo of the section, then you just calculate the proportions as normal. However, if a tempo word in section A modifies the expected surface tempo somehow, then we should experiment with calculating the speed of section B based on section A's tempo without the tempo word. So. I know that sounds a bit complicated, but here's an example of this, um, just very briefly of scenario number two or rule number two. 
So this section B here in Bruns's uh, Preludium in E uh, is in 12.8, and you would base that tempo on section A, which is a common meter, C, um, and C and 12.8 are proportional. Um, you just make the, the, the four beats of C into triplets and you get 12.8. Um, but when I did the calculation into section B's 12.8, it ended up being way too slow. So I, I kind of scratched my head and I had to think about it for a few, few hours, days, weeks. Um, and I, I redid all the calculations of the whole piece up to that point and I realized, okay, there's something else that's going on here. And um, so what, what I looked at this um, in a different way and I said, okay, the, the surface tempo of section A is in 16th, it's running along with 16th notes. If you would see that normally, you would think that, oh, that's a fast surface speed. Correct, but um, but the, uh, the the copyist or even perhaps the composer himself uh, wanted this to be slower, so they indicated the word adagio. So this is modifying the speed of what we expect in this case. So if you take away the word adagio and you just make a, you just you just play it, um, this section without the adagio, then the then the connection to section B works. Um, and then you come up with a musical tempo for a section B. So this actually happens a few times in this piece. And there's also, um, there are also uh, examples of this, um, of, of scenario or rule number one in other works as well. So, and that's actually rule number one is the more common, as far as I can understand, the more common uh, way of modus operandi of, of working from section to section in a, in a given piece. So um, those are, that's, those three points are just three of the very many points I make about tempo words in my book. And if you want to learn more, um, you, can, you can go to uh, the book, of course. Um, I'll just bring it up on my screen again in case you're um, interested. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Julia. Thank you, Domen. Uh, I, I, I start to feel like uh, the more we know, the less we think we know. <laughs> Um, perhaps, Domen, I would like to hear your thoughts on, on, on Julia's, yeah, especially have... on this tactus, uh, this, this uh, beat uh, note values relationship. Yeah, this is quite uh, quite complicated. This was a wonderful example, which, uh, you know, the, the last one that, that you showed. Um, I find it difficult, you know, I showed the Friderizzi uh, example, which is really clear, you know, he says, you know, every of these, every each each of these sections needs a different beat. This is mm -hmm. this is clear. It's not all the same, and the note values change uh, really a lot. I mean, you you saw the semi briefs, and then then he has uh, quavers, and uh, you know, and of course, it, with a long note note values, he has a sad uh, tristizia, and with with the fast note values, he has. Well, uh, you know, the first edition of this in sixteen eighteen didn't have only said that that this these uh, short examples have to have different tempi but uh, two editions later in 1624 he added these tempo words geschwind and langsam I always thought I mean, imagine that people didn't quite know what to do because the the differences between note values are so extreme that I also, when I when looking at uh, the first edition, I also wasn't sure uh, should the beat uh, adapt to the note values in the way that we take a slightly slow, uh, faster tempo for the for the very long note values. And this is, I mean, he is very clear, but uh, in some examples, it's really difficult to say because I have been looking into pieces which exists in two versions, and where only a section within a piece. Is uh, has different note values in different sources, you know, like uh, the wow. Bach Kunstfuge, which you which you which you showed the Art of Fugue. Um, they you know the complete piece is transcribed into different note values, mm -hmm. but we have pieces where there's just uh, um, a section within a piece, and then um, and then it's obvious that the 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 the, the beat the tactus can't just go on. And then I somehow imagine that if, if you get the slower version, then you, you have to speed it up. Mm -hmm. And then if you get the fast version, you know, the fast source, the source giving yeah. the, 
the first version you have to slow down. So, I mean, Pretorius, you know, says that uh, at the end, everybody has to decide from themselves which tempo. <laughs> Maybe. For sure. And I think I think a lot of it, a lot of it's becoming more and more clear to me, although you may have a different opinion that um, it does seem that each individual type of composition, each linguistic area in Europe, etc, had different had, di had different traditions associated. It's not just Italy versus Germany. I mean, that's a big, big difference, but it's also Organ, versus, organ music versus choral music has a different uh, tradition of notation. Even organ versus organ music versus chamber music has a different has a different tempo notation uh, uh, has different uh, differences there. Organ music or dance music versus liturgical music has different um, tempo traditions associated with it. And um, and so it's I I'm becoming more and more convinced that it's difficult to apply one that that that. The, uh, the, the, the principles that we glean from one type of uh, composition, let's say chamber music, we can't just wholesale apply it to choral music or, or uh, whatever. So that's, that's, that's uh, something I'm becoming um, more and more convinced of, although I, you're welcome to deconvince me of it. <laughs> yeah, we, we don't have that much time I, I just wanted to remark because you said that uh, the Silus Fantasticus sections um, have these slow words and I once analyzed Frescobaldi's uh, everything that Frescobaldi has to has to say uh, about tempo in his books of Toccatas and it's it's fascinating how much he speaks about uh, you know that things have to be slow you know it's predominantly that I mean he he warns people that this has to be slow and that and you have to to pause a little uh, before doing this and so on and not to confuse and you know, you know and, and to stop on the last note of a right. passage mm -hmm. and this is quite fascinating you know if, if you mark all the words in red and uh, you know the others in green you hardly get any green <laughs> yeah right <laughs> so that, this is, you know this is the, the style that and then yeah later developed um i saw a question by um Andrew Lawrence King in the in the chat, and I I can't really because I don't know. Oh, sorry, I just lost it. Um, he says, uh, "From where?" Uh, it's a question uh, for you. Uh, from where does the assumption of malleable tempo for and I don't know what this is STPH come? Still is fantastic. Yeah. Even show that the word adagio alone is not sufficient. Okay, so the malleable tempo, um, that seems, that is something that you have to, um, that you, you understand in terms of uh, just playing the music. Um, but also uh, Matheson, when he talks about Stilus Fantasticus, he talks about that all rules go to the garbage can except for the ones of good harmony. So he even talks about, um, I can't remember whether it's meter or whether it's tempo that the word that he uses. Um, so it's the the whole style is designed to amaze and and, and fascinate and that's the uh, and, and to to um, induce uh, wonder one, bewonderment I think is the the, uh, the term um, so and it doesn't I can't give a I can't give a, um, a better explanation for this style than if you play it you you would. If you play it with a strict tempo, except for some some pieces, there's some some still is fantasticus by Brooks Tuda that seem to have much more of a strict tempo. But if you play this repertoire, the still is fantasticus sections um, with a, a strict tempo, then um, it sounds very odd. And I think I think that's that's the best the best example that I can a uh, best uh, explanation of that that I can give. Yes, I also uh, I'm, I'm looking for this because many people, you know, they they they, they suggest this, and and one looks for evidence. I found one um, one example in uh, Berardi. It's I think uh, a, a canzona, perhaps uh, for for soprano instrument and 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 continuo. and he uses he writes adagio, and afterwards the next uh, tempo word is a tempo. Oh uh, yeah. So, so this is somehow obvious that he, right. he did, you know, the adagio did mean something uh, more than just slower, a slower regular beat. Right. I think 
but I don't, I don't, I don't see a lot of this. I, you know, this is one example that I, I remember. Right. Yeah. Um, so uh, let's move on now to our uh, final uh, presentation. That will be the second we hear from um, Alexander Bonus, who is in. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, please let me know again if the sound is uh, not great. Um, I'd like to re reiterate some things from my last talk because apparently uh, some folks couldn't hear me. Um, as a summation, I will say that whenever we use a modern metronome, we are speculating upon the tempo and quality of tempo of the past, and especially the pre-industrial past. Um, we need to make sure to recognize that just because uh, an invention exists, it doesn't necessarily mean it was applicable. And so um, with the example of Don um tempo clock, this was a one-off invention, an experimental invention used for uh, the Academy of Sciences never to be employed uh, in real music making, either in composition or in performance or in education. And in fact, it's just a mechanized version of Lullier's uh, chronometer, which was a very large pendulum, which itself was a failed effort. And so um, just because these things exist, it doesn't mean they were applicable to any um, theories or practices of mainstream uh, music making. The same goes when we see one-off uh, comments about clocks and watches from the 1600s, 1700s. Uh, these are often used as analogies, but not as practical utilities. Analogies are very colorful and they help understanding, but they are not applicable to actual practice or theory. And um, Roger North's example is, is a wonderful example of a pocket watch. Um, uh, an analogy from an amateur middling performer. Um, but what it tells me is he owned a pocket watch, which was a very rarefied technology in uh, the late 1600s into the 1700s in England. And it was particularly uh, interesting because uh, the pocket watch industry in England was going through a boom. Uh, the greatest pocket watches made uh, were in England during the very same time Roger North is talking about music and its relationship um, by analogy to um, uh, a pocket watch. So we really have to be careful about analogies versus actualities. And so let's talk about the actuality. And it's in the industrial age, the late industrial age, when practically tempo becomes more metronomic, both in education, uh, performance practices, and then later in compositional practices. And so I'll start screen sharing to show that this change is really uh, evident and lasting. This will be part of a upcoming chapter in the Oxford Handbook of Time and Music. Um, the call towards metronomic action as a practical behavior occurs in the latter part of the um, second wave of the Industrial Revolution until we get post-World War I, these calls in education. I cannot urge too strongly the constant effort to play in time. We must have a just sense of the mathematical values of notes. The only way to have a metronome in one's head is the psychological training. That is to have a thoroughly grounded sense of rhythm is to make good use of this valuable little monitor. Let us stand up for this tireless little policeman. Again, these are aesthetics um, and activities practically associated with the modern age and not with Roger North, not with Mersenne, not with Lullier or Donzenbray. Uh, the actual practice of testing musicians to a metronomic standard occurs through experimental psychology. And with those laboratory experiments, experimental psychologists then prescribe metronomic action to the larger musical culture. 
Um, and here is scripture saying that by practicing with a metronome, you will reduce your variation in tempo and time. And that was considered a benefit. Again, that's a very new modern concept. This is not uh, reduced to just the laboratory. This actually becomes common practice in modern musical education and even uh, professional aesthetics. And until we get Carl Emil Seashore, who was considered a musicologist, uh, saying that there are two fundamental factors in the perception of rhythm, an instinctive tendency to group metronomic impressions in hearing and a capacity for doing this with precision in time and stress. And then he makes the allusion to ticking clocks, which are essentially the metronomes being used in these experiments. This aesthetic transfers to um, modern age musicality, so much so that Kurt Zox says in Rhythm and Tempo, ours is a mathematically counting notation in which the quarter note is our motor unit. This is the new aesthetic of time. And let's make no mistake, this uh, really has nothing to do with the pre-industrial temporal culture. We can always find analogies, but do we find practical applications? And the answer is uh, not really. What do we find? And this is sort of the missing element. Time in the pre-industrial age has to do with feeling as well as some kind of uh, proportion. And what I'm finding is that there's a correspondence between uh, Enlightenment era aesthetics towards time and so-called Romantic era aesthetics toward time. There's not a break in aesthetics from uh, the 1700s into the 1800s, even though the metronome is invented and employed very limitedly in the 1800s, it is the feeling for time that is a fundamental principle. So we see Descartes saying, uh, the beginning of each measure has an impact and it's embodied. And we've heard about embodiment already, but Gottfried Weber says an almost identical thing, an almost identical quality is that the internal feeling of rhythm of meter um, creates this involuntary, if not extinctively stressed quality where we lay more stress on the first part of the measure, which gives life to musical time. This is the fundamental principle that seems to uh, go through multiple centuries. And um, of course, there are various ways of explaining this quality that is seldom notated. And I have a few um, concepts here that I've come across. Uh, ictus metricus, cadence, uh, emphatic and remiss, the energy of beginning. I love this one from Hauptmann. Uh, Weber says internal weight. Oh, sorry, your sound disappeared. I think, Alexander, can you hear me? Um, Alexander, your, your sound just disappeared. Oh, now, yeah. Can you hear me? Okay, yeah, when, did, when did it break off? Um, 
When exactly? Um, it was before. Before the before, Hummel. Was it Hummel? Yeah, Be before the Hummel picture. Okay. So um, the comment was that the sensation of meter was a known principle of musical time uh, and not the metronomic mathematical calculation of meter. So uh, we see that actually working in certain treatises, including Hummel, where the heaviness and lightness of musical notation is made evident. Um, and this is very much uh, antithetical to training today and, in, and research today, where we are, have this uh, embedded assumption of a mathematical metronomic uh, quality. But evidence suggests this pre-metronomic notion of feeling before mechanical objectivity. Uh, Joshua Steele in Prosia Rationalis says that given a, a, a monotonous series of rhythms, the quality of time will be made known by the performer, either in groups of two or groups of three. So uh, no one would play a monotonous metronomic series of notes, even if that was possible. They would find an instinctive grouping of twos and threes, and, and this rational way of behaving would um, be in common practice. So we have this. Uh, example here to show that, as well as Hummel um, saying exactly the same thing. Now, this is not just a 1700s phenomenon. This goes all the way through the 1800s with Hauptmann. And of course, the diagrams are altered, but the basic principle is the same, that there is a quality to meter, meaning there's a quality to tempo that has nothing to do with a metronomic regulatory lesson. Um, we see that also with the quotations for a few hundred years, starting from uh, the Enlightenment all the way through the quote unquote Romantic Age, Quantz, who says that it might be possible to use a pendulum and it is possible to find your own pulse says, I do not pretend that a whole piece should be measured off with a pulse because that would be absurd and impossible. So not only is it over precise to play towards a, a human pulse, but it's also um, a ridiculous activity. Uh, Hector Berlioz says the very same thing about the metronome. I do not mean to say that it is necessary to imitate the mathematical regularity of the metronome. All met music would be freezing stiff, and I doubt whether it would be possible to observe so flat a uniformity for even a few bars. So one, it's over precise, and two, the performance practices of the time um, denied this kind of mechanical activity. Uh, this has already been said uh, by uh, Jed Wentz, but I would say that this is a quote from Jean-Jacques Ricot, so not Diderot. The, um, the mistake is obvious because it's, it's from Diderot's encyclopedia, but this was Jean-Jacques Rousseau's description of time being completely malleable, and it didn't necessarily need instructions in notation. This was a given. Chanzy also says this in the 19th century. And he gives an example that in a common composition known as an andante, you have at least four choices uh, to perform the andante in a normal performance practice. Uh, you could perform it regularly, meaning with the meter in a regular sense, or with ret retardandos, retinutos, rallentandos, and he gives at least three other options. But the whole point is none of them were labeled tempo rubato. And there is no metronome observation necessary for any of these. This is just a common practice of artistic performance. Again, it's not a romantic tradition. It seems to go farther back um, through the centuries. Uh, so much so that uh, Rousseau says that no good musician 
will ever conform to a metronomic standard of performance. Machine for machine, it is best to keep to this. But yet we are talking about tempo in terms of a machine when we use the metronome in any degree. We are using a mechanical standard to talk about what was an embodied standard, as uh, Jed Vence also says. So how did this come about even in the first place? It didn't come about through upper echelon composers. It did not come about through upper echelon music theorists. It came about through um, what you could consider uh, less than upper echelon inventors slash uh, automaton builders, including Johann Metzel. Johann Metzel's main career was not the invention of the metronome. It was the display of automata that played musical robotic performances. He was known as the great father of caterers for public amusement. And part of the reason the metronome succeeded was he was uh, a really good salesperson. And he was, uh, you know, uh, very, very much trying to promote this for at least a decade. But he was known primarily during his lifetime for displaying these kinds of mechanical robots, which were not musical. I know that uh, seems like a very big surprise, but quotes like this one from George uh, Templeton Strong show you the disdain for mechanical clockwork activity. Uh, this was uh, in regards to um, a singer. As to Mr. Charles Brain, his voice is good and he manages it well, but Maisel's automaton trumpeter has as much expression. He looks as if he were some great piece of clockwork wound up before the commencement of the concert and made to work itself into the room and emit musical sounds and then stalk out again at intervals. This is the epitome of robotic musicality and the origins of it are from the same origins of the metronome, uh, musical automatism. Here is uh, the pin barrels of the Panharmonicon, which was essentially a clockwork device that played um, orchestral or band music. So the reaction to the metronome was identical during the early part of the 1800s. And this is perhaps the earliest critique of the metronome in action by an anonymous musician, professional musician named Philharmonicus. The constant loud ticking, which it makes at every beat, though perhaps esteemed an advantage by some, who cannot measure equal portions of time in their mind is disagreeable to those who have a real feeling for music. And it will render those who use it constantly too mechanically uniform in their performance as it will not permit that judicious acceleration and retardation of the time according to the genius of the passage in which a great deal of the expression evinced by a performer of taste consists. Essentially, he is saying musicians will alter the time according to their will. And that's the very same thing we've been hearing from centuries uh, prior. So what are we doing when we subscribe to metronomic motion? I'm going to end here. Um, what culture are we following? Well, another criticism says that for if the metronome is used for the mere purpose of learning to keep time, it would take away from the spirit of the pupil's performance and make it a mechanical affair. And him, if he succeeds at conforming to it, a slave of time. This is at the heart of mechanical tempo in education and even in recreation. It is a lesson towards obedience and the success of the metronome was not in music in the 1800s. It was very much in the obedience to mechanics. Here is the metronome in its active use through the late 1900s into the uh, 1800s into the 1900s as a scientific device for physical and mental obedience. 
This was known as an ergograph, and it was a test of uh, stamina. And if one could lift one's finger to the weight and the metronome tempo, one could find the level of stamina of the human being. That was the epitome of metronomic usage, usage before um, pedagogy, music pedagogy took it up. Here is a breathing exercise with the metronome being used as the tempo standard. Here is a labor uh, test of, of, um, of tool usage with the metronome setting the active tempo for the laborer. This is essentially the usage of the metronome in the modern age. And I think we need to get back to the reality, the pre-metronomic reality of time. And it was stated by none other than Marx, A.B. Marx, a kind of reality we sometimes forget. Continuous uniformity of any motion is quite as unnatural in music as in every other department of human activity. Can it be supposed for a moment practical or psychologically possible that in all these phases, the musical measure should remain stagnant and uniform? And yet this is the educational process of the modern age. The metronome equals good rhythm. The metronome equals accurate musical performance. The metronome equals a musical obedience that never existed in the 1600s, 1700s, and 1800s. It goes through to the performance of Baroque music via the Suzuki method. And you can find this on YouTube. I'm not going to play it here for now, but it is the normative metronomic approach to Vivaldi. And I urge you to see this on YouTube in your spare time to see how often the metronome is used as the reality of tempo in uh, our modern age practices. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Uh, this is this is wonderful. I think uh, it couldn't you know be better to start uh, with 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 you and and to, to finish with with this uh, since it actually without without thinking about this we we can't discuss anything uh, that we have discussed today. I I, I find um, now I don't know if we want to have a, a short discussion. Perhaps some some uh, of our guests have have uh, comments or uh, questions. We're somewhat over time. Yes. Ted, you, you just have to unmute. Yes, I'm <clears throat> sorry. Um, yeah, thank you very much. I completely agree um, with, with what you're saying. Uh, just two, two little side remarks, minor, minor things. Um, Rousseau takes that from Diderot um, and he changes, Diderot says it's four bars and he changes it into two, which turns into a big kerfuffle that goes all the way through to Framerie. And the people are fighting about, you know, because if it's only two bars, then there's no tempo at all. But um, he, he originally takes it from, from Diderot. But I would like to make a, a case for Lullier, because I used um, the chronometer, I, I rebuilt it, and I used it a lot in the 80s. And the great thing about it is you can play very freely with it because it makes no noise. Yeah. So I, I always tell my students, it really is a revelation um, to play with it. And I, I would strongly advise it. Well, I think um, going back to the simple pendulum might be an interesting solution to some of these tempo problems. I totally agree with you. And if you read more about Lillier's uh, intentions, it's to replace, when necessary, the human director. And so there's still an assumption that music is going to move beyond this pendulum swing. And it has to, because it's not an automatic machine. It's a simple machine that eventually recedes. And you have to be left to your own devices, in a way. And um, so there are still moments of freedom, because uh, the simple pendulum is not the um, objective automatic control of the modern day metronome. So I think I'm with you on that one. 
we have one uh, one one comment in the in the chat i would like to i would still like to present um, perhaps to alexander or perhaps inia or whoever might might be willing um i am wondering what comments you would have on the reminiscences of Chopin's students that in his lessons, the metronome never left his piano. Um, I would say we have to be very uh, careful about who says what and when, and for what reason. Um, I'm not a Chopin scholar, but I know that uh, Czerny, for instance, said that Beethoven, who is supposed to be the origins of the metronome in modern day usage. Cherney said uh, Beethoven played his music different every single time live. And so who says what about Chopin and why and for what reason? Uh, this is something that would require some kind of scrutiny. And what in what capacity was the metronome used? Was it used more as a simple pendulum or was it used in the modern age practices of an automatic regulating machine that starts at the first measure and ends at the last measure? These are things we have to ask ourselves and um, define a little bit more closely. Yes. Yeah. yeah, sorry. So I did my, my, my PhD thesis on Chopin and his, uh, his students. So this is a very interesting question for me. There is a lot of myth going on after his death. And uh, it is not known what, in which context he would use this machine. You know, he had many other things in his room. It doesn't mean that he used them all the time, you know? So all that thing about his left hand being like a conductor and the right hand being completely free, this is just really literally describing something which nowadays people refer as metrical rubato where you're, the, 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 there, there is a synchrony between your hands for a longer period of time, which uh, uh, I, I'm, it, it is really weird how the, the music progressed that uh, Baroque performers still nowadays really freely use these things and these locations in harpsichord playing. And yet the mainstream classical attitude is that that is not so, something <laughs> what is done. I, I'm saying the mainstream, not... not. So uh, yes, uh, Everything, I think everything which is said about Chopin, especially in this kind of context of, uh, uh, you know, his pupil said this and his pupil said that has to be taken with a big pinch of salt and uh, taken in the context of the time when these uh, sentences were written down. So yeah, maybe that helps. Okay, it's time to say a big thank you to all our guest presenters for your uh, time and your insights into time. Thank you, uh, Doman. Thanks to the <laughs> Slo Slovenian Academy of, of uh, Science and, and, and um, Arts, the research center of, of the Academy for hosting us today here in Ljubljana. And many thanks for everybody following, sharing this time with us. So um, yeah, stay tuned and ticking. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye, thank you.